Hello, MCI Freshers. A very warm welcome to the semester opening 2024. I think that should actually call for another round of applause. You are the student cohorts 26 and 27, which will be the years when you will be graduating. But today is the day to start your studies over here. And I would like to warmly welcome you in the name of our academic deans and our rector, Andreas Altmann, to MCI. And an applause for your academic deans, please, your study directors uh, who are all here today. Now, I'm really happy to uh, be able to, short and sweet, present this afternoon program uh, to you, together with Julian Portella, who is actually your study representative. Hello, uh, Julian. Great to have you here. Hello, Claudia. Thank you very much. It's also amazing to have you here as a professor and the deputy head of the Academic Council of MCI, where, by the way, also we as students are represented. Which is very important. The Academic Council actually um, represents the academic deans, all professors, representatives of your professors, and of course you, in, um, in, in this case, um, your study representative Julian, and Lily is also around somewhere here, I think. Um, important work because you are diverse, diverse in terms of backgrounds, in terms of age groups, in terms of uh, culture, and expectations and knowledge you bring to the table, which is all a great advantage to start your studies. And if you look at, the, uh, at some of the figures here, we have some 68 nations representing um, MCI students, which is um, awfully diverse, awfully strong, awfully rich. And um, MCI, tries to use that strength of yours in research, in actually trying to bring you together, to network, and to profit from each other. And basically, this is more than just your study program you have enrolled in. You have come to the entrepreneurial school, a university that tries to connect, to network, and to help you build your career. And um, we have got some more things in store, but Julian will be tell you more about this. Thank you very much, Claudia. Today, you will have the opportunity to network with a lot of important decisions and opinion makers. We will have here and get um, the opportunity to talk and listen to the, president, the vice president of the Intel Corporation, Greg Lavender. Thank you very much for being here. He will give us a lot of interesting insights about how to stand on the shoulders of giants. Afterwards, we will also have Benedict Böhm here. He is extreme mountaineer and the CEO of Dynafit. I'm very sure we will also be able to profit a lot from his viewpoints, because he will tell us how to succeed in both mountaineering and business. Thank you, Julian. Now, let me point out again, this is a great opportunity to net network also maybe after this event. You will uh, get the opportunity to have some refreshments outside, and maybe you are lucky enough to also talk to one of our speakers, address them, comment on uh, whatever it is they have shared with you. This is ever so important. And uh, MCI, in all departments, in all study programs, boasts some 27 different study programs uh, in all areas. Meaning, we do have programs in management and in the areas of management and society. So there are people in here who focus on the economy, on sustainability, on economic growth and the de defini uh, definition of which, entrepreneurship and tourism, social work, social health and public management. And on the other hand, we have programs in technology and life sciences, programs in biotechnology, industrial engineering and management, mechatronics, medical health technologies. So all of these programs are helping or we're trying to help solve the problems of the future. This will be your aim in your careers. And today, um, the opportunity to network should help you with this. 
So it is of utmost important to talk to the people next to you. And if you're sitting to someone next to you from your program, try to find those who are not in your program to actually um, share your expertise, connect, build a base together, um, and think outside the box. Because this is what successful research is also about. And um, you also find your academic deans, your study directors here today. It could also be a great uh, way to introduce yourself again and maybe talk to them um, and make sure they remember you. <laughs> exactly. What is also important for us is to point out all the MCI service departments which you will be able to take advantage of. For example, we have the student support, we have the library, we have IT services, student and career services, a lot of different institutions which help you to succeed in your everyday student's life. Because, let's be honest, the students in general, we do have a great life. We, some of us would even consider it the best time of their lives. But however, we also do have to say, face some challenges, like today with the slides. <laughs> but this is exactly where we, as your student representation union, and all the MCI services come into place. Because our vision is that each and every one of you, like you're sitting here, can enjoy a balanced and fulfilling life in order to grow both academically, personally, and mentally during your student life. We achieve this by creating an open and approachable environment for you. If you need any help, just talk to us. So what exactly we do? I always divide it in four different sections. We provide guidance for you in all the different topics. We can provide financial support for your projects. We offer services for your everyday lives, and we represent you by talking to MCI and also to politicians. This is what we do, so make sure to check out our office. But that's enough from us. I think now it's the time to introduce and welcome our rector, Andreas Altmann, who will guide you for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Claudia, and welcome, Andreas. Thank you, Julian. And welcome again, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, dear Claudia, dear Julian. Many, many thanks for being here, but especially you. You, the hopes for our future, the young generation, your parents have been investing in you, have been putting their hopes in you, have invested their dreams in you. And now you're sitting here. You have been selected as you have been realizing and seen on the picture. You have been selected out of almost 4,500 applicants. And you've got the opportunity to study. And studying not just means get smarter, learn, acquire knowledge. Certainly, that is something which may be necessary, at least helpful. But it's never, never ever sufficient. Because what is, I think, the dream and the secret of studying at the MCI or studying in general is pursuing your dreams, reaching for the stars. And I think it would be a nice idea if every one of you just took his cell phone or her cell phone and wrote himself, herself, or a friend the dream which you've been marking down the most important, or perhaps it may be two or three dreams, what you want to achieve through your studies at the MCI. And as we will tomorrow celebrate our great uh, our grand graduation ceremony, our convocation, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we will have four graduation ceremonies, 5,000 guests, 600 new alumni. And then on this occasion, on this very day, when you graduate, you may recall 
the dream you had, take it out and look at it and see whether it has come true. Or other dreams have come to life and perhaps been adding to your initial dream or dreams. And I think this is what is so important, what we want to what we, what we want to encourage you. Reach for the stars. Now, let me see. Aha, this is me. Funny, okay. That's true. And now let me also tell you something what we've been trying. You have been looking backwards about applications, about alumni, about achievements, about little, you know, figures. But this is what we want to pursue for the next years, the MCI, for you and your successors. Now, first of all, strengthen our research. Perhaps you cannot imagine how we started. It is less than 30 years ago that a core team of very, very few people, some of them are still around, Peter, who we will see later on, Brigitte, Claudia, uh, Tommy, and all those have been around, and we did not have anything else but a dream and a vision. And the vision was, we want to create impact. Impact on society, impact on the economy, impact in science, impact in education, but especially impact in you. Nurture the future, shape the future. And this is what we wanted to do. We did have nothing but a vision and a belief. And we went down to the cellar of the university to look for old tables, which were not in use anymore, and old chairs, take them out and start in a mini office. And this is what has, be, what, has, what has come true. Now, research is not just to create knowledge, but also to create impact. Impact in creating solutions, creating innovations, new business models, new processes, new technologies, new ideas, how we can better perhaps solve the problems of today and avoid problems or solve them in the future. And one thing we are strongly pursuing, now I will be three days in Vienna next week, just for one reason, to lobby for doctoral programs for the right. You know we had elections recently and we need the right to confer doctoral degrees. That's not just to, to confer three letters or two letters, doctor or PhD. No, it is to provide opportunities and to strengthen our research. Then, what we would also want to further develop, and we've been very, very successful already in that, we started our first so-called online program, which is a hybrid one, but it is called online and is largely online, thanks to Claudia and her team and Peter and all those who have been investing their energy. We've been starting our first online program in 2014. We want to strengthen our online activities and our online competences, mobile learning, so that you can acquire knowledge from wherever you are. Support your success. Internationalization. I just came back from Warsaw. I still have the suitcases in my car. And two new, new collaborations with top-notch institutions in Europe. The one is the ESMT in Berlin, and the other is the, is the ESCP in Paris, Madrid, London, Berlin, Warsaw, and Turin. So, both institutions, top-notch institutions, and you know what is interesting? They have been approaching me at the advisory board meeting whether we would be willing to work together. Startups and entrepreneurship. Follow your dreams 
If you have a dream of becoming an entrepreneur, of pursuing a project, of, you know, just creating something, of shaping something, of becoming an, un, un, an independent entrepreneur, not having to report to, uh, to others, but being responsible for what you are doing, then approach us. And we've been very, very successful in that. And we even invest in startups, and we even provide money for startups. We just uh, got a donation of 500,000 euros last year to nurture our startup, uh, our startup initiative. Then certainly what you can see here, I think that has been pursued for a long time, is our new campus. And I will have uh, even meetings tonight with politicians to convince uh, them about the necessity and collect money. And what has Claudia and, and uh, Julian already, what they, have meant, uh, what, what they have said? Create and engage in networks. A network sounds very technical. I rather call it or add to the word network the word relationship. I'm still in touch with the people I've been studying with. And investing in relationships is trust, is confidence, is emotion, is engagement, is sharing your thoughts, is helping each other. And perhaps uh, I was working as a tour leader through Europe for American students throughout my studies. I think for six years, I always left the university early so, and came back late in the summertime to guide students through Europe, from London to, I don't know, Athens or Cairo and uh, back and forth. And there was a little, little training, a seminar before we, I, I, we, we were sent out as tour leaders. And there's some hints, some recommendations I, st I still recall like it would have been yesterday. And the most important, I think, is the one which comes now. You have a group of, let's say, 40 students in your back. You're the two leader sitting next to the driver of the in the coach in the bus. Now, you have in your neck behind you, you have a bunch of students. Hey, Andy, let's party tonight. Hey, Andy, what are you doing tonight? Hey, let's go out. And actually, certainly, I, I still love that, going out, partying as many of you may perhaps experience later on. But the recommendation was, those who approach you for parties or, you know, they will find their way around themselves. You do not have to care about them. You may celebrate with them, but you do need to care about the silent ones in the back. Those who ran out of money, those who are homesick, those who just left their boyfriend or were left by their boyfriend or, 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 um, or yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, and you do not have to deeply involve in that, but instead, you know, you're not provide an alternative. But care about them. Those who ran out of money, those who do not, fe who feel left out. And that is what I would encourage you to do. Look for the silent ones in the cohort. Look for those having had perhaps parents who didn't love them. Those who are not coming from perhaps rich families. Those who are a bit, let's say, shy. Take them at their hands and form a cohort, form a group. This is what I would like to encourage you. And. To come to an end, this is just a few pictures. Also, you will study at one of our six, present, presently six uh, facilities, which can be shown here, but also make use, not just to stay with your, uh, with your group, but also go to the, to the other facilities, to the other study programs, department, and so on, but also make use of Innsbruck, of the beauty, of the opportunities of Innsbruck, 
because sports, outdoor, culture, all that traveling around Europe is so wonderful. And for tonight, do make benefit of this little extra, how, what, what would I show, of this little extra value you can get, uh, first of all, you will get uh, reductions on the MCI uh, also, uh, shop, shop products, but also you may, uh, as you can see here, you can win, uh, you, can you can win prices. Just scan the QR code. Now, coming to an end. You know what that means? What that shows? It shows some kind of a desert. And let me give you this example and conclude with it. Two wanderers. One student from the MCI, certainly, and someone else are, are hiking, are wandering through the desert. And the one kicks the other one with his elbow and asks him, did you see there's something at the horizon moving, a black spot? Oh, really? And it comes closer. And both turn pale because they realize it's a lion. And it's a huge lion. And it comes closer rapidly. Now the two look around. Is there some hole, a tree, some kind of shelter? No, we are lost. So the one, I call him or her the MCI student, takes down his backpack, takes out his sports shoes, and tries or starts to put them on. And the other one asks the MCI student, what are you doing? Do you really think you will be faster than the lion? Not faster than the lion faster than you. And most students, or m the many people think that's a cruel story, that's a brutal one. And I see it totally different. Because what, what it shows, the only opportunity to survive, but especially to shape, to create, to be successful is to not wait until the lion comes, not give up, just Think about what is the opportunity. And 95% of the opportunities you will miss out is not because of capabilities, not because of lack of money, not in, uh, in, uh, because of lack of knowledge. It's just because you do not try because you think it, it's useless. And that is the story which I want to conclude with. All the best. Enjoy your studies. Now I invite Peter Mirsky, our chief information officer, first man or a member of the, one of the first members of our team to introduce Greg Lavend and to, uh, to continue on in our event. Thank you, Andreas. I'm already wired. Uh, thank you for, for this inspiring opening talk. It is the most important thing to run faster than, than your enemies. I think that is... That is a cool lecture here, and, and a very good learning to take it away. Um, it's my distinct pleasure today uh, to welcome one of those leaders in the technology realm, Mr. Greg Lavender. He is Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President of Intel Corporation, and I'm quite sure that you're all familiar with this, with this company and with the brand of this company because I think more than 60% of our computers are wearing Intel inside as, as the heartbeat of their computers. I think the real interesting thing from Intel is that they are having a very, very strong research and innovation part in their DNA, and it's one of those companies who are inventing, foreseeing the future, working on the future, supporting universities, they are running their own research centers globally. I learned from Greg 
that Intel is going where the talent is, and integrating that into the design of their products and even also producing these uh, microchips by themselves, branding those chips and bringing that, them to the, com to the consumer market. And I think this is extraordinary for a company of, of today where most of the competitors are just specializing on one of those items. Greg has more than 40 years of, um, I would say, experience in academic life, but also in business life. And before he had his tenure at Intel, he had really important roles in other global companies like Cisco, for example, um, the Citigroup, or even Sun Microsystems, which might be not familiar to each and every one of you, um, but um, in, in the valley where you now find the offices of Meta, of Facebook, they are at Sun Microsystem campus uh, from, from the days when um, since when Sun Microsystems was dominating also our technology market. Um, Greg has is, um, earned his bachelor degrees in computer science, uh, went on at Georgia University and then went on to uh, Virginia Tech for making his master's and PhD. He became a professor and he shared also yesterday with me that being a professor when one guy would have knocked on his door and saying, well, and some years from now, you will be the chief technology officer of Intel. That would have been unbelievable. And I think this is also something which is an option for you. You might not dream, as Andrea said, what you can become. You should always dare to do really crazy things. Now, please welcome, please join me in welcoming Greg Lavender to the stage. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Standing on the shoulders of giants is, is I think, a very inspiring motto. Um, please just fire away. What I still want to mention is that after Greg's inspiring talk, we will be open for your questions. So it is a super idea just to mark down your questions. Whatever you want to ask, bring that to the table. Mics will be brought directly to you, and I will do my best to moderate this session. Greg, the floor is all Thank yours. you very much. Pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation to participate in your Freshers' uh, Day one. And um, I could talk a lot about technology, because I've spent almost my whole life, I, my father taught me to program in a programming language called Fortran when I was 14 years old. He was a computer scientist from the 1950s, so in some sense, my future and destiny was determined uh, by my father's uh, uh, career. But um, it's been a wonderful life. Uh, it's not over yet, but uh, I want to share with you a perspective that you might not expect to hear from a computer scientist. I also um, have had a good liberal arts education and a classical education, and so I'd like to bring this idea of history and the classics and the predecessors in the historical cultural legacy, mostly Western, but some Middle Eastern and, other, and Asian culture that informs us today, and given the AI era and the cloud era that we're in, and the fundamental changes in technology, society, culture, human interactions and relations, ethics and responsibility is yet to be determined in this new world. But we have a rich legacy on which mostly Western Civilization Foundation to build upon. And I'm going to give you a visual tour de force because I, I have over 300 slides that I've collected to prepare a book on this topic. And I only have about 35 of them that I'm going to share with you. So it's going to be very visual. There's going to be some words on some of the slides. I'll let you read the words and I'll make a few comments about the graphics that I'm going to show you. My talk is dedicated to um, Isabella Papadaki Sordina. I have a very close Greek friend. Isabella was his grandmother, and she adopted me as her American Greek son. I'm not Greek, I'm American, but she became my Greek grandmother, and I learned a tremendous amount of information from her during her long life. This metaphor of standing on the shoulders of giants, people often attribute to Isaac Newton. 
I'll show you that that's actually not true. He did, he did use that phrase. But the actual metaphor, which is in politically incorrect today, is to say it's dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants. And that was attributed to, it's hard to maybe read that at the bottom of the slide. I'll read it for you. It's attributed to Bernard of the Chartreuse. It's a monastery outside of Grenoble, France. If you've been there, it's a 12th century Neoplatonist. And he was a Carthusian monk. That was an order of, of Christian monks. And it's from Greek, patho Greek mythology, the blind giant Orion carrying Sedalion on his shoulders. He was blind and he was searching for the sun. And so he had a, a small person sitting on his shoulders to help guide him toward the sun. If you own a two pound British coin, you may not have noticed around the edge of the coin, that phrase is actually etched onto the two pound British coin, standing on the shoulders of giants. Ostensibly as a tribute to Newton because he's the one that's often given the credit for it. But there's actually several times where this has been used. As I mentioned, uh, Bernard of Chartreuse is credited by John of Salisbury from a publication in 1159 for having the first person to have done it beyond, beyond the Greeks. But also Newton then said when attributing to Robert Hooke's work in optics in physics, what Descartes did was a good step. You, Robert Hooke, have added much in several ways and especially in taking ye colors of thin plates optics into philosophical consideration. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, in one of his um, poems, The Friend, says the dwarf sees further than the giant when he has the giant shoulders to mount on. And what I'm referring to is the giant is our rich cultural history. If you're a, a software person or you know something about the Linux operating system, it was created by Linus Torvalds. Tor Linus Torvalds also gave tribute, as Torvalds would later put it, I had hoisted myself up on the shoulders of giants and he was referring to Richard Stallman who created the Free Software Foundation that started the open source movement. And he was referring to the fact that GCC was what this, the GNU compiler allowed him to basically bring Linux into the world. And then Google Scholar, of course, has co-opted this as part of their tagline on Google Scholar, if you can see that. Um, but what I wanna do is I'm gonna give you what's called big history. You may not have heard about this in your academic studies, but if you look at the cosmic calendar from when the Big Bang moment to the present day, um, it turns out this area right here is all of human history. It represents only the last part of a blink of an eye in the cosmic calendar is where all of human history fits into 0.23 cosmic seconds since the Big Bang. Everything that we know, everything that we've done as, as humans is recent and we have a much more to achieve, uh, to achieve, I think, our full potential as a species. So let me take you then further into the future, 1503, the, the Renaissance era. This is a textbook, an academic textbook called the, Philosoph called the Margarita Philosophica. It was written 2,000 years since Pythagoras. And I'll talk about Pythagoras in a minute. It was a, it's called the Philosophic Pearl of Wisdom. It was used by professors like myself and others as a way to teach basic knowledge and understanding to university students, undergraduates. It was authored by a Carthusian monk named Gregor Reich in Germany. Uh, he lived from 1467 to 1525. He was known as a magister, basically a teacher, and he would teach a pupil, and it was an interactive dialogue way of learning. It wasn't like go read the book and do the homework and turn in the assignment. It was very interactive. And this, this is a colored version of the front piece of this book. And first they give tribute to essentially the Philosophia Divina, right? Sort of the philosophy of religion. You have St. Augustine, St. Gregory, and then you have St. Jerome and uh, St. Ambrosia. They were theological scholars in the Christian era. But you also have a tribute to the Greek philosophy. These are the three faces of philosophy. And these are the seven liberal arts represented as women. And we have the philosophia naturalis across the top here. This is naturalis, rationalis, and that nature, natural philosophy, rational philosophy, and morality. These were topics of study in this book. And then the seven liberal arts represent the seven virtues. Uh, and there's typus logica, Logic, rhetoric, grammatic, grammar, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. And I'm gonna focus more on arithmetica. She's sitting right here. This is arithmetica. 
but you have all the different logica is over here, okay? In computer science, we do a lot with arithmetic, we do a lot with logic, so I'll get to computer science eventually. And then, of course, at the bottom you have Aristotle and Seneca. So they represent philosophy of natural philosophy, which we today call physics, and philosophy of morality. So, let's jump at the Arthian School of Athens. If you've anyone's ever been to the, um, the, the Vatican libraries, this, this, were, these were actually, this commissioned art of Raphael, the famous Italian painter, was commissioned by Pope uh, Julius II. And uh, these are my own photographs of, uh, this is Divina, right? So this is the philosophy of Divina, right? This is the Christian philosophy. This is actually, this is actually the liberal arts. Uh, but I'm gonna focus more on what's called ra the rational and the natural philosophy here of Plato and Aristotle. And uh, just to prove that it was actually me, I actually then sort of photoshopped myself in as a selfie to give you a perspective. That's my natural height. This gives you the sense of the scale of this if you haven't actually been to the Vatican libraries. So here's the magister, the teacher, lecturing to the disciple from the, the book of the Margarita Philosica. And, and so the first three grammar lessons, or the first three lessons, was considered the Roman trivium. It dates from Roman times. It's grammar, symbol, the, symbol, the symbolics and rules of syntax, language, dialectics, which is a way to have arguments or conversations, but using logical reasoning, and, and not just using words, but using meaning of things. And then rhetoric, which today we would call blogging. And then bo to go to the graduate level of education, you would learn uh, Boethius from what's called Boethius's quadrivium, it's arith arith arithmetic, which considered pure numbers. Think of the integers. The music is in numbers in time, because it has a fluid or a motion to it. Geometry is numbers in space. And then astronomy was numbers in space and time. So to do astronomy, you needed to study and understand arithmetic, multiplication, division, ultimately algebra. Um, and then, of course, more advanced today in the modern world. And then we have these additional topics, as I mentioned, natural philosophy, I mean, physics, moral philosophy, and rational philosophy. Here's a copy of the Margarita Philosophica. This is an uncolored version of the front piece. But there's a, a lot of allegorical imagery in here that I don't have time to go and explain, but I would encourage you to look into it. And here's an actual picture of Boethius uh, in, the mid in a book from the Middle Ages, teaching from the quadrivium to the pupils like you would do in a classroom. So this idea of a university education is not new. Here's a snapshot of the actual uh, index or the table of contents of the Margarita Philosophica. And you'll notice I've sort of highlighted Quantus Arithmetica. I took Latin for three years in school. Uh, so this is the theory and practice of algorithms. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Some of this work actually was lost during the Dark Ages when Christianity stuffed out the historical knowledge from ancient Rome and Greece. That's what the Renaissance did. It brought that information back to life. Robert of Chester in 1140 to 1150 uh, was an English Arabist and translator uh, who obtained some textbooks from the Middle East. They were known as the textbooks of, of uh, the tra Latin translation of the algebra of Al-Khwarizmi. Al-Khwarizmi is actually an area in what is now, what was Mesopotamia, now is sort of um, north of uh, Baghdad. And, and Al Khwarizmi was a professor at the School of Wisdom in Baghdad in the, in the 12th century. I'm sorry, earlier than the 12th century. So Hindu Arabic numeral system was brought into the Western world from the East. And um, they used a lot of, for astronomical calculations, they used base 60 arithmetic, not our base 10 arithmetic that we use today. So they understood radix arithmetic or radix algebra, if you know, what, know anything about Mathematica. Um, and then modern trigonometric term sine is derived from the Latin term sinus, which is a mistranslation of a Hindu word uh, which representing a half of a chord. So our, even our trigonometry was known at that time but had been lost in the Western world and was brought back through this sort of international uh, uh, translations of things. Here's a stamp, a commemorative stamp of Al-Khwarizmi, uh, Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Musa Al-Khwarizmi, 780 to 850 in the Common Era from this area north of Baghdad, uh, Uzbekistan. And basically, the word algebra comes from algebar, algebra in Latin, algorithm in Latin is algorithm, and algorithm became algorithm, our, proper, our current usage today. So this history is very rich in terms of the intellectual capabilities that people had at the time. 
And we think we're so modern, but we have this great historical legacy that we've inherited. And of course, here's a close-up shot of the school at Athens. And this is a pantheon of rational thinkers. And we focus in on, let's say, Plato and Aristotle, because these are two forms of thinking that even in today's world create a dichotomy in how we actually communicate and work in, 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 in society and in culture and in technology. So basically you have Plato pointing to the heavens. So Plato, and you've heard of Platonistic philosophy, or the Platonistic idea of perfect forms, it's the world of the mind and how we interpret and, and sort of think of things uh, and abstract them. So if you take abstract algebra or abstract mathematics, that's considered Platonistic mathematics. Whereas Aristotle was grounded in the physical reality of the world and he has his hand pointing down, which is sort of, we have to basically take the intellect and we have to take reality as it exists on our planet and unify these two ideas. But this schism exists even today with you have metaphysics and philosophy, you have physics and science. They don't often interact very well. You have the theoretical science and you have applied science. You have a theoretical physics. You have experimental physics, right? You have theoretical computer science, algorithms, theory of algorithms, theory of AI. You have physical applied um, um, hardware. And I like to think is software is metaphysical. It comes from our minds. It has, but you can't do anything with it unless you have a, a physical application of it, which is the hardware. So the hardware and software come together. And this idea of idealism, which is sort of things, the perfect forms, the perfect circle, the perfect square, the perfect triangle. But in Aristotle's world, you don't find a perfect square and a perfect circle and a perfect triangle in nature. We have to have approximations, we have statistical approximations to help us with those problems. And here's Pythagoras over the bottom left of the picture. And this, this tablet right here is essentially represents the harmony of the spheres. The monad was the perfect unity, a one-to-one -one ratio. Diapason, if you know music, perfect octave, a perfect fifth, and a perfect fourth. So you get this sort of structure. And he had a metaphysics of unity being perfect. Duality, think of couples, duality. And then harmony, when you bring the spheres together and you harmonize, just like you harmonize in music, you can harmonize in mathematics and understand the motions of the heavens. So lots of astronomy at, in that time was basically understood in terms of calculating the motion of the planets, predicting the lunar eclipses, the solar eclipses, because they were important for religious cultural reasons, as well as for farming and other planting reasons. Um, and, and if you notice in this part of the picture, there's some dispute. It's not well known actually who this character is. There's some debate. Some people believe it's Hypatia. Hypatia lived in the fourth century. She was the daughter of the librarian of the, of the, of the great library of Alexandria. She was uh, murdered by Christian uh, monks and uh, this is believed to be Hypatia in Euclid's Elements in 1310, which is a textbook of teaching a woman, teaching men geometry and mathematics and astronomy and algebra. So she's often considered the first math female mathematician, in, as we know in history. Uh, and so we believe that's who, that's who, that's who that may be. Uh, and uh, I'll get to the next person in, in a minute. Uh, has anyone heard of the Antikythera mechanism? The Antikythera mechanism is a device that was discovered in the early 1900s by some Greek sponge divers off the coast of an island called Antikythera. It, it's, in the, it's in the archaeological museum in Athens. These are my pictures of this device. It's essentially a celestial clock. This is a, a, a reconstruction of what we believe this celestial clock did. It showed the motions of the planets. It, showed, it calculated when the eclipse would occur on an 18-year cycle. It predicted lunar eclipses. It was used basically again for religious reasons and cultural reasons and farming reasons. And this device was the first analog computer, very sophisticated. This is the gearing. If you, it's been x-rayed uh, with MRI machines to actually sort of reverse engineer how it works. It actually able, it calculates leap years. Find a clock today that can calculate your, your leap year. It's a digital clock. But this is the harmony of the spheres. So Pythagorean harmony, onto harmony, and Archimedes, who was a brilliant engineer and Greek uh, from Syracuse, brought together the gearing, and, and they believe that this is an Archimedean device that was discovered in this shipwreck. It's amazing that it was preserved, and there's been a lot of uh, work to, de to decode it and what it means. 
but it basically it captures much of Pythagorean co cosmology. So Pythagoras lived in sort of 500 BC, or in fact, pre, he's pre-Socratic, before, before 500 BC. And uh, I'll draw your attention to what's called the Platonic Lambda, is this idea of, this is a power of two series, if you know binary arithmetic, two to the zero is one, two squared is four, two to the, I'm sorry, two to, two to the zero is one, two, two to the power one is two, four to the, two to the power two is four, two to the power three is eight, that's a binary series in power of two arithmetic. And this is called a geometric quaternary, uh, which will appear in just a minute. So this is Pythagorean, pre-500 BC. This is another picture, this is Arithmetica inside the Margarita Philosophica. Notice that at the top here it says Typus Arithmetica. If you notice her dress, there's a one, a three, a nine, and a 27. So this dates from 1500s. The Pythagorean triple is being represented on her dress. This is the power of two series. Two to the zero is one, two to the one is two. This is a Hindu, Hindu Arabic numerals. This is a Hindu four, this is an eight. So they've captured this idea of arithmetic. Boethius is represented by this individual. Pythagoras is represented by this individual. What this is portraying is that the ancient way of computing was using little stones called Roman, in Roman and Latin called calculi. These calculi stones are moved around on boards to, ca to calculate your taxes, calculate the price of goods and services. And this is a wax board using a stylus where you write out onto, onto the wax using Al Khrizmi's algebraic mechanisms to basically calculate faster. And this, this, this represents a contest where you're trying to basically compute with the old way of Pythagoras in the new way of algebra and using this stylus. And they would run contests to see who could actually compute the fastest as a, as a contest to do the new math. So think of it as new math, algebra versus arithmetic. Um, and then in this picture, we have actually, this is uh, Ptolemy holding the planet Earth. This is uh, another ancient figure called a Zoroaster holding a celestial fear, what the stars look like. This is Euclid with his tablet. And if you know what recursion is, if you study computer science or you, you study uh, recursive function theory, it's a type of mathematics for, that gets used in, in uh, computing. And then AI, recursion is actually how regression analysis works. So most AI algorithms use recursive algorithms. And so you can easily think of this as like, well, how do you compute whether some, a number is odd or even? We compute odd by calling even, and you compute even by calling odd using this Boolean conditional. Uh, Escher represents it this way. So recursion in computing or mathematics and recursion in art. But uh, this person right here is actually Raphael. Raphael is the first selfie in art. He painted himself into the School of Athens. So this is Parmenides, and Parmenides wrote about truth and false. And he said that basically most people lie. And how do you determine the lie from a truth? You need to have logic, you need to have reason, and you need to be able to compute the truth. And so he's again pre-Socratic, pre-500 BC. And this idea of truth is again captured in Typus Logica in the, in the Margarita Philosophica. So he, this is uh, Logica. Parmenides is hidden under this rock. There's a rabbit here named Problema. There's a dog called Veritas, and there's another dog that looks a little tired called Falsitas. And that the, the purpose of, of, of logical reasoning and logical thinking is that nature is infallible, infallibilia. So nature is telling us the truth. That's Aristotelian reality. We think in our head platonistically about the world, and you bring together the syllogistic logic of Aristotle, the Parmenides notion of getting at truth and falseness, and the rabbit represents nature, and we pursue science through nature to inform us to become more integrated and more intellectual. And this is just, this is, there's different versions of this book that have different sort of representations, so these are from two different versions of the same book. So that brings us to the modern era. We've actually reached the cloud. So the Tower of Babel, think about programming languages. There's over 4,000 programming languages today. It's a Tower of Babel, just like the historic Tower of Babel was. As if you've been to the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, you'll have seen this painting by Rugel the Elder. It's one of my favorite paintings. And, uh, but more importantly, the emergence of the empirical and scientific method was brought into the world by Francis Bacon from 1561 to 1570. 
like 1626. Um, this picture is the front piece of a book that he wrote um, that is called Novum Organum Scientarium. These two pillars represent, this is, uh, they're called the Pillars of Hercules. In history, the, the Pillars of Hercules were the Rock of Gibraltar, the entrance to the Mediterranean, and this pillar, there's a debate as to which of two mountain peaks in Morocco represent the other pillar. This is the ship of knowledge exiting the known world of the Mediterranean into the open sea of the Atlantic. And the whole idea of this idea is to, is to change the way we think from the old world, right, to the new world of thinking. And he invented this way of encoding the English alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, G, K, L, M, in essentially binary. So nobody knew about binary at this time. So Francis Bacon is credited with what's called inductive logic. We have deductive logic and inductive logic in computer science and in, in AI. And we use binary arithmetic. So he was the first to actually figure out how to do an encoding of natural language into numeric language. When you do chat GPT, you're taking natural language, you're feeding it into a Baconian machine called an AI algorithm, and it gives you back some new knowledge, hopefully, from the query that you've issued. Now, there's another newer version of Bacon's book. Uh, this happens to be my personal copy. It's a 1640 English edition of Baconian's earlier 1623 edition. Um, the Pillars of Hercules, as I've described, has been updated in this version. This is, sorry, this is uh, Oxford, Oxonian, and this is Canabrigia, Cambridge. This is the visible world. This is the mental world, Platonistic, Aristotelian working hand in hand to develop the new world of science and knowledge, uh, as I described before. And these are the different books that, that Bacon wrote to basically build the foundation of that new knowledge uh, in this book. And then we go to Blaise Pascal, which you may have heard of. Again, a, Pyth a Pythagorean uh, Tetrakis here, Powers of Two series. Uh, Pascal built the first actual analog, analog arithmetic computer. It, did a, it just did addition and subtraction. Uh, Leibniz, uh, a German philosopher, which you may have read about Leibniz, uh, he actually figured out using binary encoding in, so in, the si six, in the late 1600s to basically build a calculating machine, mechanical, analog, using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. He was the first person to, to articulate the idea philosophically that all of human knowledge can be represented in ones and zeros and stored and retrieved in law cases, science questions, questions of truth and falsity and court cases could be computed and calculated with precision to reach truth, which of course we know that most court cases don't, don't necessarily all focus on the truth. So this is Leibniz's paper. Uh, I, won't, I won't spend much time on this, but basically he, this is where he articulated the explication of arithmetic using binary and representing all human knowledge in this way. This is an actual a poor photograph I took of a manuscript in a museum under glass, which is why it's a bit uh, unreadable. Here he says, unum autum necessarium. One is all that is required. One and zero is all that's required. And here's an actual where he calculated two to the 14th and base two arithmetic to 16,384, and this is the binary representation of it. He also designed a medallion to capture how does this work, how does binary arithmetic work, and how you can encode all of knowledge, all of literature, all of everything that you could think of to basically just using ones and zeros, and today AI just uses ones and zeros to do everything it's doing. And so, but actually, Thomas Harriet also discovered this uh, slightly earlier, but never actually had any application for it. Uh, so Leibniz gets the credit in history. And then once we have binary arithmetic, we're able to do what's called Boolean logic. George Bull, if you've ever heard of George Bull, he wrote, wrote a, a treatise in the 1800s on the laws of thought. Uh, Gottlob Frege figured out how to basically use uh, mathematical logic as a way to represent truth and proof. And then of course, uh, Bertrand Russell did Principia Mathematica. Um, did anybody notice the news this week about the, the Nobel Prize being awarded? One of the recipients was Jeffrey Hinton. Jeffrey Hinton is the great grandson of George Bull. De Morgan's laws for logical inference, you, you probably think, realize, think of these as Venn, Venn diagrams. You've seen them in the basic mathematics course. It actually, that's the basis for logic in circuits, right? You have A and B, A or B, 
right, and AB. So basically, you can build these different logic gates using De Morgan's laws ever before we ever invented silicon. And he had this book on formal logic, the calculus of inference, so the first time that we used inference. And then we have the universal laws of electromagnetism. Each one of these is a, is a, is a lecture on its own. Alessandro Volta from Italy, Michael Faraday in the United Kingdom, James Clerks Maxwell. If you study electronics, you'll learn Maxwell's equations. And Oliver Heaviside, uh, British as well. Uh, M Maxwell was Scottish. Uh, came up with the laws of electromagnetism, which we, do, which we all study in physics. Uh, we actually today study what's called quantum field theory. Uh, and then the laws of thought were then combined. You took Boolean logic and Boolean algebra and binary arithmetic. Claude Shannon came up with the first way to represent that as a digital circuit. And then John von Neumann took this idea using Boolean algebra and built the von Neumann computer, which we all use today. And then Alonzo Church and Alan Turing. Church was, his PH, Church was uh, Turing's PhD advisor at Princeton University. They both came up with two different ideas of abstract computing. One's called the Lambda Calculus. Every programming language you use is definable in the Lambda Calculus today. It's the foundational programming languages for all programming. And of course, Alan Turing, everyone knows who he is, and he invented the Turing machine, which basically created the, the limits of computing. Uh, and then these three gentlemen at Bell Labs in 1947, uh, John Bardeen, uh, Walt Bertan, and William Shockley invented the transistor. Uh, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments and Robert Noyce, one of the three co-founders of Intel Corporation. I met him uh, when I was a graduate student. Uh, invented the integrated circuit, which today is what we use in all of our computing devices, our cell phones, etc. And so finally, after all this time, the ancient duality of the abstract versus the concrete has merged. We have Hardware, instead of using calculating stones, we have silicon, right? And we build lots of powerful processors like GPUs and CPUs and cell phones, et cetera. And instead of using a wax calculating board, we use software using your favorite integrated development environment. And now it's all binary. The world has been translated into binary. And it doesn't matter whether that's a GPU and that's an AI algorithm or you're just writing some code for fun for a video game that this ancient duality has actually merged finally in our society. And now it's no longer a dichotomy of the physics and the metaphysics, it's combined. So the, meta the software is essentially comes out of pure stuff in your brain, that's the metaphysics. The physics, I spend lots of my time in physics, I spent all day actually at the physics department uh, here at the university and uh, looking at the quantum uh, uh, computing world. I, I have a quantum project at Intel. Uh, when I was 17 years old, my father first got me onto the internet. I first logged into the internet as a high school student because my father was a computer scientist, and this is what the internet looked like in 1977. Today, we're in the cloud, right? We have all these devices, everything's interconnected. You're using Windows, you're using Linux, you're using Mac, doesn't matter. You've got your phone, you've got your tablet, you're connected, you're intercommunicating. It's all done in binary. And uh, but chaos reigns within. I'm, my PhD is in computer networking. I, I, I've been dealing with chaos my whole life. And uh, the computer's always down, the network's always down, something's always down. And so this is just a haiku. Uh, chaos reigns within. Reflect, repent, and reboot. Order shall return. Flush all the bits. Start all over. You get new bits. Things, good, things are good. And this is what the internet has become. It's an internet of things. That's good. And it's also bad. Some of the things are bad things. Some of the th bad things are hackers. Some of the bad things are phishing attacks. Some of the bad things are cybersecurity threats uh, to any IT system. But it's growing at an exponential rate. And this is, what a, this is, this is a re relatively recent version of the internet as a fractal. So I showed you the picture in 1977, very simple. These are all the nodes on the internet. There are billions of them, billions of them. It's a fractal. You're here safely at home and work. You went out for a coffee. Someone here hacked into your laptop, snooped your password or your credit card, if you're not encrypting everything. And your thoughts and ideas, they're out there. Your intellectual property is out there. It's on a disk somewhere. It's in a fiber optic network. It's roaming around the internet. It's being snarfed into an AI model, OK? Um, your unencrypted personal info is one of those little dots. So trillions and trillions of pack on, packets, it's all photons and electrons, all represented as ones and zeros. Tribute back to our binary arithmetic. Now, what's next? Well, that's another talk, because I'm out of time for this one. Uh, the machine, does, this is, uh, everyone knows who Antoine saint Azubri is. He's the, he said, the machine does not isolate us from the great problems of the world. 
of nature, but it plunges us more deeply into them. And this is a little Lego kit that I built uh, of Rodin's The Thinker to inspire me. It sits on my desk in front of my computer. And the question is, what's next? But don't forget privacy and ethics. The biggest challenge we have, and I can say this as the CTO of Intel and someone who's been in this industry 40 years, is the ethics, the privacy, and the responsible use of technology. This is for your generation to work through. You can blame me and many others for having created the, the, the world we live in, um, built on this great cultural legacy that I've just shared with you. Um, but you know, we have to really think this through carefully and not just rush into a future in which we don't um, deal with this problem. And it is a serious problem. I have a program at Intel Labs on uh, deep fake technology detection. We do a very, very good job of detecting deep fakes, which are manipulated videos, manipulated audio, manipulated anything. Uh, it's done being, it's being using AI to do the fakes. It's very hard to detect because they're always evolving and getting more clever and smarter. Uh, at best right now, using the best AI techniques we can with the most computing power we could throw at it, we, all, we can only detect about 90% of the deep fakes. It's the other 10% that are the scariest ones. So this is an ongoing area of research. And finally, for your generation, as someone who's at the end of his career, uh, Carpe Diem. And one of my favorite Roman uh, Greek poets is Menander. He says, when you're moved to find out who you are, study the graves you encounter as you pass by. Inside rest the bones and weightless dust of men or women, once kings or queens, uh, and the weightless dust of, of tyrants, wise men who took, and women who took pride in their noble birth, their wealth, their fame, or their beautiful bodies. Yet what good was any of that against time? Time is inexorably moving forward all the time. Think of it as entropy. Entropy is a principle in physics that th things tend toward disorder. Death is just the ultimate disorder of a biological organism. All mortals come to know Hades in the end. Look toward these to know who you are as young people. Think about what you want to be. Think about the future you want to have. Think about how you can contribute to it ethically and responsibly. And take this great cultural legacy into the future to continue. And here's some recommended reading. The Trivium is actually still in print. You can also get a copy of the Quadrivium. Uh, if you want to understand Parmenides, the Pre-Socratics, Pythagoras, and the origins of Greek philosophy, there's a wonderful book called The Think Like God. I think there's, an, there's probably a Kindle version of it. Uh, if you want to learn about those computer technologies I talked about, read this book, The Universal Computer. Uh, there's a nice book out from Princeton University on the Leibniz on binary arithmetic and binary encoding. Uh, Boole and uh, Claude Shannon, uh, the logician and the engineer. And then, of course, there's a biography on George Boole. And if you're interested in AI, you should go read Judea Pearl's book on the book of why. It's about causal inference. And there's a British MRI, inventor of MRI, he should win the Nobel Prize in physiology at some point, Carl Friston, has mapped out how the brain really works. And Judea Pearl has been a long time researcher in causal AI, causal effects. I think that's the next big breakthrough coming in AI. So that's a hint toward the future. And with that, I'll, I'll stop there and we'll have a little chat. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> right, thank you. Here we go. Well, Greg, may I start with the first question before mm -hmm. our uh, freshers are coming up with their ones? Um, I intensively felt that you feel this responsibility on your shoulders also. And how would you translate that and how does that translate in your role as being a chief technology officer in a company with 130,000 employees, um, with tons of responsibility, also with economic pressure? Yes. Um, how, how would you translate that, and how does it, um, in a day-to-day -day life, look like? Yeah, well, um, I was also a startup entrepreneur in my early, uh, early, early part of my career, before I became a professor, actually. And uh, so, you know, I come out of a, well, first I should say, my father was a career military intelligence officer, so I grew up with strong cultural values of right and wrong, ethics, integrity, and mm -hmm. service. And so I think, um, you know, I bring that to, to work every day, and I bring it in my personal life as well, as to... Always, always try and the best you can because it's always imperfect information and imperfect knowledge that you have to make any tough decisions, but to always essentially factor into it the consequences of something. There's lots of new innovation 
but we always have to ask ourselves the question is, okay, is it, is it the right innovation at the right time? Does it have the right sort of, I'll call it, you know, positive impact on society? I mean, obviously cyber terrorism is a real problem in the world, and we have lots of geopolitics. It's the instigator of that type of thing. But um, I think we also have to be, have a societal consciousness, and what I like about the young generation, maybe more than my generation, is that they do have that social conscience. And so I think, um, you know, in some sense, we haven't created a perfect world for all of you uh, in technology, but it's, it's a pretty good one. So but t take it and do useful, good things with it. Mm. You can always do awful things with it, but that's true of any technology. But I think, you know, we need to have this basic idea of ethics in, in, in technology. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, now the floor is open to your questions. May you help me because it's really hard to see who's raising hands. Here you go. Oh, sorry. And then I, I know you, but maybe you would like to introduce yourself to the audience. Yes, uh, Werner Stadelmeier. I'm the head of the Department and of Environmental Process and Energy Engineering. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a rather personal question to you. Uh, when you walked us through the School of Athens, uh, I thought of Platon's symposium and I missed Alcibiades. So how does beauty come in for you, aesthetics of mathematics? Do you view mathematics in a just utilitarian sense or is there also an ethical component and an aesthetic component for you? So I didn't quite, I didn't quite get all that. Did, mm -hmm. did you, can, I didn't, I didn't no. it, was, it seemed to sound a little bit garbled in my, maybe I should uh, take this headset I'll try off. again slower. Yeah. Um, I missed Alcibiades, so that as... Uh, oh, yeah, so he's actually, he's actually yeah, in yeah. The, there's, there's, yeah, well, but, but, but I, you, I, I, have, I have a whole book's worth of content, yeah. so I take every single character that's in the School at Athens, yeah. and I have a focus area on those. Aver Averos is in there, Alcibiades is in there. So there's a lot of other characters. I just focused on a few of them to kind of push a couple, a particular theme I was talking about. And I could have gone through all the seven yeah. liberal arts characters as well. So, so this would be my question, yeah. because for me, Alcibiades would stand for beauty and aesthetics of mathematics. That's right. So what is your personal relation to this? Do you also think about maths in uh, aesthetical? Uh, yeah, yeah, point? yeah, obviously. I mean, I mean, some of the most beautiful uh, algorithmic things I've seen are ma you know, mathematical proofs, for example. I'm a big fan of John Nash, the game theorist, mm -hmm. and his work, and actually his life story as well. But so, yeah, I think one of the great things about science is there is a natural beauty in the world, and the job of a scientist is not just to understand the, under, the underpinnings of the physical, mechanical, chemical processes that are at work, but there's a certain natural beauty that arises from nature that we as a scientist get to observe, and in, in case of uh, Intel, I mean, we, we, we are state-of-the-art you know, semiconductor manufacturing company. We're currently manufacturing our latest chips at um, a width of 18 angstroms. That's the width of 18 atoms. That's 1.8 nanometer. Our latest chips, which we're manufacturing today, it's just remarkable. At the end of this de decade, you'll have a trillion transistors on a chip the size of my thumbnail. That's like an entire rack of computing today into a chip the size of my thumbnail. It'd be an SOC package that's bigger than that. But essentially, to me, that's just miraculous, that we have the power to manipulate the atomic structures at that level. Like I just spent some time at the university here, here in Innsbruck today with the physics, uh, quantum physics teams. And um, you know, great work going on there. But there's this natural beauty of nature that arises through biology, through different species. We understand a lot. We don't understand everything. And so for me, nature is the perfect teacher of what's possible, and I think it's just remarkable that we as a species on this planet have the intellectual, mechanical pro way to th think through this. The only difference, and a good friend of mine is uh, the lead archaeologist at the Agora in Athens, and he would tell you that today Silicon Valley is the new Athens of 500 BC when everybody was sending their children there to be educated and go to the university and learn about philosophy from Aristotle and Plato. and so. The, the idea that we have this great historical legacy, he would say the only thing they lacked was the technology we have today. But they did understand ethics, they understood morality, they understood human behavior, they understood the technology of their day. They built ships, I mean, Archimedes was a brilliant you know, engineer scientist. So they just lacked the technology and the, and the precision machinery that we have today to do all the wonderful devices we create. So I think, but, but again, I think it, that power it's real power, economic power, national power. It can be used for ill, 
but we have the power to basically use it for, for the right purposes, not, not destructive purposes. That's my personal belief. Well, thank you. You're talking about the new Athens of today as still as a physical area, like the Bay Area. Yes. Would you say that it's also a virtual concept it, well, possible? Yeah, it's gone, it's gone virtual. It's no, you don't, it used to be you, know, you had to go to Silicon Valley to kind of build your career in technology. You had to be at the epicenter of the thought process, the activity that was going on. And um, I think I first went to Silicon Valley in 19... 87 as a grad student to a meeting at Stanford Research Institute, you know, based on my research work. And, uh, you know, it was always sort of this magnetic attraction, but, you know, Austin, Texas, Seattle, you know, there's other places in the United States, and obviously, I mean, Munich and, um, you know, London, all over the world, there's uh, innovation happening because of the network, and I, I, I was a network engineer for most of my career. My career followed the, uh, the curve of the internet, um, and so I was lucky as a young person. In fact, my first job out of school because of my father's connection. I was a network protocols engineer on the ARPANET in 1983 at the Defense Communications Agency. So I worked on the very early ARPANET um, as a young person and I got hooked on networking and went back and did my PhD in that area. Fantastic. Well, we're still open to questions. Oh, here you go. Yes. We are talking a lot about yep. the future, and I have a personal question. As being a shareholder in Intel Corporation, I and many others are suffering since the beginning of the year, while the stock tanked a massive amount of around 50%. While last quarterly figures didn't look that promising, I'm wondering how will you restore the former glory, and what, will you, uh, what improvements will you take to prevent such losses in the future? while other major companies working in the same field of technology are gaining momentum and market capitalization, like AMD, which uh, gained um, about 25%. Sorry, so I'm hearing the echo. Well, so maybe you wrap that question again up. It's really hard okay. for you <laughs> to yeah, understand you. Well, there's Just maybe in your own words, easy going. There's sort, of a, there's, sort of an echo, there's sort of an echo in the room. I think maybe you come, sorry to, come about into, that. The, into the middle like, section here, maybe, yes. if you could. It sounded like a really good, important question, so I want to make sure I, I hear yeah. it right. While being a shareholder in Intel, uh, we, we all saw a massive loss of about 50% oh. in the stock yeah. since the beginning of the year, while other major companies like AMD gained momentum and market capitalization. Yep. I'm wondering how will you uh, restore the former glory of Intel and improve? Oh, and okay. I got it. I got take it. Take yeah. cautions to not, uh, so that things like this don't happen mm -hmm. again. Well, um, The stock market is a, is, a, is a stochastic system, and it's not rational. There's lots of books published on the irrationality of stock markets, so I can't, I can't tell you. Uh, I can tell you that we had a, we had a uh, you know, it's, ex it's very expensive to build new factories, and it's very expensive to do the physics to get to 18A, and we're actually now working on 14A, 14 angstroms, 1.4 nanometer. So we've, we're spending billions in capital to build out factory capability to produce the world's chips. Uh, they also believe by the end of this decade, The semiconductor industry, which is about 400 billion to 500 billion dollars today, is going to be a, tr a trillion dollar market. And the whole world is rushing to basically leverage, take advantage of semiconductor technology. So something I've learned, I used to work, I was a CTO at Citibank for six years. I went over to the dark side uh, for six years. And uh, I'm, I'm joking, but um, 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 it's, if you're a, A, a manufacturing company, automotive company, airline company, building and spending huge amounts of capital dollars to drive new technology and create things that have never been created before into the future. You can't measure that on a 90-day shot clock that the short sellers in Wall Street want to measure you on. It's a long-term investment game. Boeing, you could put it in the same category. You know, any, any heavy industrial company, the automotive industry here in Germany, in, in Germany is under intense pressure because of competition from the Chinese on electric vehicles. So investors need to understand that a 90-day shot clock, like in a basketball game, a 90-minute shot clock, is not an effective measure of the real value of what's being created. So we're in it for the long term. If nobody was in it for the long term, there would be nothing new coming out. So we're in it for the long term. I'm a shareholder too. Uh, last time I checked, the stock was down 44%, but it, 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 did, it did drop quite significantly. 
But I think the, there's the, if you study Wall Street, there's the buy side and the sell side. So the buy side, they're buying it up because they understand the value of the long-term capital investment and the ROI that will occur. The short sellers or the day traders who just want to make a buck that day or that week or that month, um, they're, they're, playing the, they're, they're playing the rumor mill. And if you, if you read the tech press, which I do every day just to kind of get the sentiment that's going on, is um, the more salacious the article, the more clicks, the more clicks, the more they get paid. So they like to write provocative sort of like death and destruction articles so that you'll click on it because that's how they get paid. So there's a financial incentive to report negative news because negative news sells and positive news doesn't sell. So I would just say Intel for the long term is a good bet. If you don't have the stomach for the long term investment, you should sell and go play the short term game. Is that all? Sure. Um, small question from my side. Adding to yeah. that, uh, Intel has 83% of free floats on stock market. That is quite unusual. I'm sorry, free floats. Uh, so stocks which are not bonded to, to huge yeah. corporations right. like Black, BlackRock. Yeah, yeah, they're in funds, investment funds, ETFs, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But we have large institutional investors as well, and they're not selling, they're buying. Next question, please. So, hi. I'm sure you've heard of Moore's law, meaning that a number of transistors in an IC will double in about every two years. Yep. And as it seems, we are slowly reaching the physical limit on that. And my question is, where do you think is the industry headed? Is there, will there be more of a focus on software optimization, or are we, yep. uh, is there some big breakthrough ahead which will allow us to improve RLCs even further? So I'll, I'll quote my CEO, Pat Gelsinger, who I've known for 25 years. Uh, I've only been at Intel three and a half years, I, but I was his CTO at uh, VMware before that. So uh, we've got a long history together in Silicon Valley from when I was at Intel, and when I was running the Solaris Operating Systems Group at Sun Microsystems, and he was building uh, chips at uh, Intel. But so we have a long uh, engineering, co-engineering history together. Um, so so, uh, so Moore's Law was a great prediction by Gordon Moore, one of the other co-founders. Uh, I also met him before he passed away. Uh, he lived to be 94 years old. and. Uh, so Moore's Law basically is this idea of the number of transistors will double year over year per time. And that was true sort of starting in 1968 when Intel was founded, and that's what was the that was the basis for the business model. So, but as I said, we seem to keep finding new ways in physics to bend the curve. So with 18 angstroms, 14 angstroms, you're, okay, what's the, what's the bottom of the, of the well, uh, the electron well, to basically sort of tap that out? Well, we're also building our quantum chips at 18 angstroms right now. We use uh, spin quantum qubits to do that. It's a little different approach than superconducting qubits. But um, as Pat would say, we can essentially um, you know, exploit every element of the periodic table, not just silicon, to continue to basically get the, the transistor density that we need and the manufacturing capability that we do. As a Dutch company, you may have heard of it, called ASML, all the extreme ultraviolet lithography work, whether you're build, whoever's building the chips, it's U EUV. Um, they're, they're the unique single supplier of that technology in the world right now. And everybody's racing to get uh, advanced chip technology, no matter what nationality or country you're from. And so um, what I've learned during the course of my lifetime is physicists and physical chemists are very clever about figuring out ways to move electrons rapidly between A and B, and now photons between A and B. And so I think this is a problem that uh, we'll solve. And I'm not too much worried about the um, sort of running, running out of, uh, you know, the, the physics to, to do that. Uh, I'm more worried about the fact that we can't bend space and time because there's only 168 hours in a week and one human brain needs some sleep between that time window. Um, I haven't slept more than five hours, maybe six hours a night since I was in high school. Uh, that's just the way my brain has been wired. And so my fundamental limit on people is that we have to sleep at some point. We can't stay awake all the time, even with drugs. And so um, I, have to, I, I was on phone calls last night until uh, 2 a.m. with California after spending the whole day here uh, in the city. And uh, let's just say that uh, every brain I know at Intel is working to basically, within 168 hours, solve these very hard problems. And as I remind my boss, who thinks we can work infinitely long, is that you know, we're too puny to bend space and time. We can manipulate the atoms but we can't bend space and time and extend the work week. We Thank don't have you. enough mass to do that. We need a black hole. Peter, here, another problem. Sure. Hi, 
First of all, thank you for your time and thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge with us here today. I think I speak on behalf of everyone here when I say that. Uh, kind of steering away from the technological questions, I wanted to ask you something a little bit more personal. Um, I'm starting my education here at the MCI. I've started very recently. And I want to make the best of my time here and kind of gain a lot of skills and skill sets that I'll need in the future. And I want to ask you, what skills do you consider essential for students entering the business and tech fields today, or maybe just in general? Yeah. So, so, the, so there's sort of always like, you know, a spectrum of a complexity of problems. And if you study computer science, you study algorithmic complexity and system complexity. Um, so complexity is the enemy. Whatever the, wherever the source, it could be natural complexity of the physics, it could be complexity of organizational structures, the complexity of getting financed to actually do a startup company. So you have to learn to deal with lots of uh, complexity. You also have to deal with not just rationality. We're, we're good at rationality. We're also good at irrationality. So you got to tell the difference between rational and irrational ideas. But the, the thing that I've always taught my students, particularly graduate students, who would get discouraged because the problem they were working on, they sort of, you ultimately hit some sort of a dead end or something that seems intractable or impossible to overcome. And what happens a lot of times, and this is a cognitive thing, is we tend to over constrain a problem, restricting the sort of degrees of freedom that you have in the problem. And we sort of try and, and sometimes you take a, you take a hairy woolly problem and you try and kind of put structure and process. And in computer science, we teach you to divide and conquer, take a complex problem, break it into sub problems, solve the sub-problems, and then try and roll it back up so that you, you take the leaves of that problem de deconstruction and you roll it back up and solve the main problem. Sometimes something really counterintuitive happens and you have to be experienced enough to recognize it, which is sometimes you need to make the problem bigger. We always want to shrink the problem down to which we can solve it and we can fit it in our heads. But sometimes the problem needs to be enlarged to release, the, to release some of the over-constraining that's going on in the problem. And it's very counterintuitive and it's very scary. And, and I always used to teach my students who got scared of that problem of making the problem bigger because they wanted to make it simpler, is do not let the problem defeat you. Another way to say it, and I saw this sign over in the physics lab earlier today, is failure is not an option. So you've got to be determined. You've got to know when to give up and switch ideas, switch tactics, switch technology, switch your thinking, switch the mathematics. But you've got to follow the problem where the problem takes you, not the problem you want to solve. <laughs> Wise words. Thank you so much. Maybe we have, we have time for one. We have two questions. Two questions. Okay. Very good. Very good. Yes, hello. Um, I was questioning, uh, could you give us a slight uh, prediction when quantic PCs are starting to be around for us all and where Intel is right now in like uh, development matter? Yeah, so I just, I just completed a, a 10 year uh, external review. It's very common in, when you have these uh, futuristic research projects. Uh, your board's always asking you how many, how many more billions of dollars do you need to keep spending on this and when do, you, when do you decide you've done it and when do you decide that you should give up? It's always a hard decision. So I brought in a bunch of external people from the Department of Energy, from academia, from other companies, you know, they're uh, luminaries or experts in this field uh, to sort of give us some advice. We sort of hit the 10 year period. We we're actually manufacturing um, spin quantum qubits um, on wafers at two degrees Kelvin. And we can essentially um, um, test those and we can actually use the basic building blocks of a qubit. Uh, we can assemble those using our 18 angstrom, A1.8 nanometer process technology. And we've actually got a test chip out into the, into the academic community with 13 you know, uh, qubits all done in semiconductors, not superconductivity. So the question really with quantum computing is how do you scale the number of physical bit qubits to get a useful number of logical qubits to solve interesting problems? What's an interesting problem? Interesting problem, there's lots of deep problems in material science, there's lots of deep problems in physics and chemistry and other fields, medicine, that we believe that if we could get the right algorithms and we could get the right sort of computing capability, that we could, we could crack these problems more easily than we could try and crack them with sort of traditional classical physics techniques. So I don't have the answer for that, but the answer is it's at least 10 more years. And I verified this with the physics department earlier today. I asked them the trick question. I said, how long do you think before your trapped ion, you know, uh, uh, qubits is going to basically uh, reach a more, I'll call, I'll call it a more practical or usable thing. But I would probably say you're not going to get a PC under your lap, under your, on your desktop or laptop. This is going to be in the cloud somewhere. You won't know. 
but basically the, the cost of it, the power to, to run it, to cool it, all that sort of stuff is not something that you can sort of package up and put in a form factor that I think humans will be able to deal with, at least in my lifetime, maybe, maybe in years, I don't know. Uh, thermodynamics is notoriously hard. And so I would say that um, you'll probably get to use one in the cloud, let's say at the earliest 10 years from now, if you're a PhD in your field, and they'll have access to it through the Department of Energy or the government or something. Uh, but these are gonna be very expensive, expensive, very specialized systems. But I could be completely wrong because somebody like you in the audience could come up with a better idea and go solve it. Perfect, and the last question, please. The mic is not. Okay, this hey works. There. My last question is about AI safety. And I was wondering if you have a roadmap to save AI in a way that it's aligned to human values. And do you think it's going to be realizable given the race of AGI, the race to AGI happening right now? Yeah, so um, one of the talks I considered giving here, but given the diversity of this audience, I chose not to do it. I'm actually giving a, a talk tomorrow at the Technical University of Munich for the, to the engineering physics you know, faculty on neuromorphic computing. So I would sort of go, or go Google neuromorphic computing, sort of the next generation of, of AI. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not yet convinced on AGI. And, uh, and the reason for that is when I was deciding about going to grad school, while well, I was a network engineer, um, I actually took a course in natural language processing using a textbook by a former Stanford faculty member named uh, Terry Winograd. I, I read some um, t books and papers out of MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Yale, uh, Stanford, of course. Um, you know, I mentioned Carnegie Mellon. So Herb Simon, you know, was uh, at, at, at Mellon, or Marvin Minsky at MIT. So I, I really sort of dug into AI back in that period, deciding what, should I do my PhD in that area or go, should I go stay computer networking? I think I made a wise decision for that time period. Let's call it 1985, 86. Um, because the internet has just been a tremendous growth opportunity and great technology, and it's been a very productive career. Um, think about it. Back then, my personal computer was, a, was an 8086 with 16-bit processor, 192 kilobytes of memory, and two 360-kilobyte floppy drives. That was the high end. I had the top-end computer at that time. And you can't do much AI in that with a 16-bit processor and 192 kilobytes of memory. You need a supercomputer, an NVIDIA supercomputer, or a, you know, a cloud supercomputer to do training of today's large language models. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to bend the curve algorithmically. Most of these algorithms are what are called quadratic algorithms. And there's a lot of innovation going on right now, both in software and in silicon, to bend the curve of the cost of the training. And more importantly, the amount of power and energy we're consuming in these AI, uh, large-scale AI systems, is going to suck in all the electrons out of the planet. Not all of them, because we can, we can get more. But basically, uh, there's billions in capital private equity being spent and national sovereign funds, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait, building large-scale sovereign clouds, spending billions of dollars to build their own capacity so that this is going to become a geopolitical thing. It's going to be considered a strategic advantage to have your own domestic AI uh, in the world. And so the responsibility and the ethics is going to get intertangled with the geopolitics of what's going on in the world today. Uh, the Chinese want their own, you know, I've, even I got asked to come speak in Romania, they want to build their own sovereign cloud. The Greeks are building their own sovereign cloud. I've met with Mitsotakis on this. And so there's a, there's a big effort to build out more and more capacity, and I'm really worried more about the energy problem and the, and the, and the heating problem in a global climate pl heating up planet that it could have much more, worse effects. It could amplify the effects of what's already going on. So I think we all have to be careful to not, you know, think this is some new nirvana. There's a lot of government, you know, national, parcel. So there's, there's an active dialogue going on online, you know, through various events and things like that. I would say join the dialogue. Get yourself educated on what the real issues are. A lot of it's fraud. A lot of it's uh, criminal behavior. And uh, a lot of it's misogynistic. So I think you know, all of you have a voice to have in this new world that's happening, and you need to be participatory in it. Form a school group or whatever, and take on some of these topics. Maybe make it the topic of your undergraduate or your graduate thesis. Is come up with some ideas about how we actually manage ourselves into this new future. Because if you guys don't do it, you're gonna be living in that world. I'm not gonna be here. But I'll help you today to get started. Well, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Um, I think we learned a lot.
also thank you so much for your open words. Um, I saw on one of your slides that you found a poem which ChatGPT wrote about you. <laughs> and, and it ends... Well, ChatGPT hallucinates, yeah. if you didn't already know that. So. That was it. Yeah. yeah. And it ends, all the best to you who bridges tech and heart, a tech born soul and a work of art. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Wait a Thank minute. You. Wait a minute, Greg. Greg, 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 wait a minute. We're really proud. I know that you mentioned all these famous universities which you are collaborating with and where you're running your research. We are super proud of our bookstore. Oh, great. Which always carries hoodies with our MCI brand on it. Perfect. So Thank you very much. This is one of our gifts. Thank all you right. so much. Here you go. <laughs> Andreas, I call you up on stage. I think you are the one who's going to announce the next steps in our program, right? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second part of our welcome event of our opening of the academic year. And it is a great pleasure to announce a wonderful, exciting, adventurous guest. We will be having the pleasure of enjoying some thoughts, some inspirations and insights from the Chief Executive Officer of Dynafit, of Benedikt Böhm, who is an extreme mountaineer, who is a WWF ambassador. He's the founder of Helping Band. He's managing director of the ski touring equipment manufacturer Dinafit, which just had built a fantastic uh, campus, a fantastic site facilities at the border at Kiefersfelden between Austria and Germany, between the Tyrol and the Free State of Bavaria. Since Benedict Böhm had joined the company in 2003, the brand has developed from insolvency into a global market leader. And in his second life, Benedict is an extreme ski mountaineer and a distinguished guest speaker. Both in business and in sports, Benedict Böhm not only plans his goals meticulously, but also works passionately and consistently to achieve them successfully. He climbs mountains up to 8,000 meters and higher, not only without oxygen and outside help, but also in the so-called speed style, in order to reduce the risk by spending less time in the death zone. And he'll tell us more about this death zone. These borderline experiences are particularly helpful for his management career. Benedict Böhm completed his studies in the United States and in England but it was his borderline experiences in the mountains that proved most valuable for his management career. Benedict is an ambassador for the Worldwide, uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature and a founder of Helping Band Brand, as I already mentioned, which is committed to the preservation and expansion of nature and marine conservation areas. And uh, you will also be equipped with one of these Helping Bands uh, as a gift by Benedict Böhm, which we really, really appreciate. Now, before I ask Benedict to come on stage, there's a little secret. Benef Benedict once applied for studying at the MCI. And he still is successful. Benedict great that you are with us and before coming on stage you have been and are watching some exclusive not yet published pictures from his last speed record record onto the world's sixth highest peak called Cho Oyu with 8201 meters 
in Tibet. Benedict, many, many thanks for being with us. We look forward to your talk. Why are we doing this? Huh? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Good morning, Himalaya! <laughs>
Real brands, and all of you, you are also brands, because one day you will hopefully finish your studies, <laughs> and one day you will apply as a brand, as your personality, as your individual. Um, and real brands, they attract people. They are so attractive that people want to be part of it. And they don't, no, extract. Extraction is the opposite of attraction. Attraction means that people want to be part of you, want to be part of your community, want to be part of your brand, want to be with you. Um, and extraction means you call them all the time, you hustle them, you make a lot of advertising, promotion, and whatsoever. And this is what we did. We basically came together as a bunch, bunch of people, bunch of athletes, I would almost say. That's what our brand is still today, by athletes, for athletes. And we just had a dream. We had the dream to build that sport. To build that sport. So not only the brand, to build that sport. And this is how it happened suddenly that this brand from 2 million turned into 120 million euros. And the, ma the market size of ski touring, and you're at the right place here in the middle, in the heart of the Alps, um, the market size of ski touring turned from 30 million euros to 1.5 billion euros. Why? Because we made the sport attractive. We made it lighter. We made it more sexy. We made it more fashionable. We made it young, etc. and so on. It's people who do things. It's not just, you know, it's not just happening. It's not just given. It's in the end people who cooperate together and suddenly do something. And in the best case, you do it with such an obsession that, yeah, things turn out in a, in a positive way. Um, we were also thinking a little bit in a new way when we started to climb these 8,000 meter peaks because that was also an obsession. So none of us is climbing an 8,000 meter peak, and I mean this a little bit as a symbol for everything you want to accomplish in life, and none of us is climbing an 8,000 meter peak just like, like that from today till tomorrow. What I learned over all this journey, you know, starting here with our one, 2,000 meter peaks, maybe 3,000, etc., and then going to the Western Alps, 4,000 meters, then going to Peru and climbing the first five, 6,000 meters, and ending up in, in Peru in hospitals. Has anybody been to a Peruan hospital of you guys? But many, many years ago, not in Lima or something. Um, we learned that we did everything wrong we could do wrong. We did everything wrong we could do wrong. And that's, I think it's a beautiful thing that you decided to study here because in the end, and it's, by the way, scientifically proven, we learn 80% by doing, by actually doing it. And what I learned over all this journey with a lot of setbacks, with almost losing my life um, and losing our lives, with lung edemias and with avalanches and with people dying around me, people dying in my arms as a young man, um, I would say I learned one thing. That it's all about preparation, you know. Um, and you can think about an 8,000 meter peak and you probably all of, all of you, as you are here today, you probably all have dreams, um, maybe some more, some less, some have clear ideas, some have less clear ideas. But in the end, what I learned for myself, and I think that I really want to give you as a, as a recommendation is, um, and this is also, by the way, scientifically proven, is yes, you can dream big, absolutely. Think about this 8,000 meter peak, even you are only in base camp, and you're far away, or you're only doing um, you know, the, the 2,000 meter peaks here. But what I learned is, don't make too big steps. I learned that I have to go slow in order to go fast. What does it mean? Think big, but a lot of small steps. And then correct these, these failures, and that's basically what we did. Correct these failures fast. Because if you make too big steps, your failure will be also very big. And that's the biggest mistake I made, that I was already thinking, oh, next day it has to be an 8,000 meter peak. And what is proven, and I think this can give us all, all of us, and I'm standing here, and it feels like yesterday, actually, when I graduated, or when I even started my, my studies. Um, we as human beings, and again, this is scientifically proved, we as human beings, we overestimate, we overestimate what we can achieve, what we can accomplish in the short term. But we underestimate, we underestimate what we can achieve in the long term. And that's all what, what happened, you know, with Dunafit 120 million suddenly being on an 8,000 meter peak, but it was many, many years. And was this persistency in this ultimate belief that we can do that. And I remember when we went back to these 8,000 meter peaks, and here we call, about, we call it the death zone. Um, so death zone means that we have a lack of 80% of oxygen. If you would take out of this room here, out of this conference wall, if you would take out 80% of oxygen, we would all die within a couple of minutes. Some a little bit sooner, some a little bit later. But minus 80% of oxygen is just too little. 
It's like a little candlelight. You take a cup over that candlelight, and the candlelight is just, you know, it's just gone. And that's how it is with our organism. So what we always wanted to do, and what was very clear for us, that we always climb without supplemental oxygen, no supplemental oxygen. Um, how many 8,000 meter peaks are there? Does anyone know? 14, exactly. The highest, Mount Everest. What do you think, just to get a little bit of a feeling, what do you think, how many people have been to Mount Everest? This looks best on your CV, right? Mount Everest looks best on your CV, so um, it's the most popular mountain, obviously, of these 14. The others are much more... Okay, but anyway, I don't get too, too much into that. But what do you think, how many people have been successfully on the top of Mount Everest since it was climbed from Hillary in the 50s? Any idea? Pardon? 40,000? Okay, it was roughly about 11,500 people. What do you think, just to get a little bit of an idea, how many of these 11,500 people have climbed Mount Everest without, without supplemental oxygen? So no, as you know, the, the, the Nepalese call it the English air, so without English air, without supplemental oxygen, to compensate that lack of oxygen, just to get a little bit of an idea. 380 people. 380 people, so not even 400 people, have been to Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen, by their own, by their own, by human power, you know, by their own, uh, by fair means, more or less. It was always our natural understanding that we want to climb without, so no oxygen, that we want to climb without, no Sherpa, by ourselves. We wanted to be independent. Why? Because as a young man, I've seen um, someone on a high peak when a climber ran out of oxygen, he ran over oxygen, and you have to imagine it's not only minus 80% of oxygen, it's also very cold, minus 30 degrees, um, wind, avalanches, uh, glaciers, crevasses, etc. And basically, it took too long, maybe only, I don't know, one, two minutes? It took too long to, you know, to sort of screw in the new oxygen bottle, and the person was already dead. It was a, he was already dead within the short term, because you are dependent you know, you're dependent on this oxygen. For us, it was always clear we want to be totally independent. We want to feel our, you know, our own human capital. We want to be 100% relying on what we have, what we have as ourselves, and not depending on, on a, let's say, external drug, which is um, allowing us to, to be up there or not. So what we did, and I would like to invite you, and I think this is the second big chance we have as Europe, um, as opposed to our American neighbors who have a total different statistic than us because they found companies very quickly, usually right after the studies. And this is my second wish to you. If you have an idea and you ever will graduate or whatsoever, do it right away because you have nothing to lose. Usually live in, you live with a couple of mates, housemates in your room. You, um, you're not used to, I don't know, have big insurances. Usually you don't have kids to pay, etc. and so on. And it's the much better as the American way, you know, to get... Um, to get self-employed or to start your own, your own business right after studies. This is maybe one thing I regret. And Europe is rather 50 or something like that. So we lose a lot of entrepreneurs, and I see here the entrepreneurial school, right? The entrepreneurial school, this is what we should do, you know, creating more entrepreneurs and giving them the courage. And I will talk a little bit about courage um, here. So what we did and what you do have to do as an entrepreneur is you have to think sometimes a little bit deductive. Deductive thinking is the opposite of analog thinking. So the analog thinking is what we usually do in a process, etc. And that's great. We need that as human beings because we become more efficient and we optimize, etc. But deductive thinking means sometimes that, especially when we have, I don't know, exceptional goals, utopia. For us, it was an utopia to climb an 8,000 meter peak. That we have the freedom. We give ourselves the freedom. And I think this is an invitation to be an entrepreneur, to be part of an entrepreneurial school. Um, to think from a white piece of paper, this is deductive thinking. To not almost ignore, I would say, almost ignore what is up there. Because what you see here is base camp. That's where everyone starts. You know, this is basically what I showed here, usually on 5,000 meters, more or less. Um, and what you see here on the right-hand side is the traditional way, no matter if with or without oxygen, no, doesn't matter, the traditional way how you climb 8,000 meter peaks. When we started 21 years ago, um, always it was clear you go you know, from base camp, once you're acclimatized, I'm not going towards that too much, but that's a big part of the preparation. I learned that 80% of the success is preparation, the other 20% is flexibility, by the way, because the world is changing faster and faster and you need some flexibility. There is not one fixed route to the summit, um, but by all preparation, by 
preparing these unknown unknowns and trying to transform them into known unknowns, and still you need the flexibility because maybe here there's suddenly a big crevasse you, hadn't, you didn't have on your radar or an uh, avalanche field or snowed or whatsoever. You, know, you have to have this flexibility and you shouldn't be frustrated, but it's part of an expedition. We all, as we here as individuals, it's 8 billion people on this planet, we are all an expedition, all of us. You know, and probably we are on the safest expedition any human being has been before. So, back to the topic. We said, what would be the best idea to climb such an 8,000 meter peak, no matter if it's possible or not, but what would be the best idea? And in the end we said, wouldn't it be the best idea to climb such an 8,000 meter peak, such, an, such a giant, within, for example, 24 hours, as you see here on the left-hand side, or 18 hours or whatever we gave ourselves? Why do you think could it make sense to climb a peak in the death zone, in this risk zone, very fast. Anyone has an idea? Why could it make sense? We actually wanted to reduce our risk by speed. How can you, this sounds a little paradox, right? Why could you, how could you reduce your risk by being fast? Very simple. Um, statistically, on the, on the right-hand side, you spend three, four days, even five days, in the death zone you're permanently exposed to the death zone. So you permanently lose energy. Even if we would take a five-star hotel up there in the death zone, we would die. Think about the candlelight, which doesn't have enough air supply to survive. And we said, wouldn't it make sense that we reduce our risk statistically because we only spend one day as opposed to a couple of days. We only need one day of good weather. And that was another part. Usually, I mean, we, we are going up, we are going to, this, to these heights where usually airplanes fly, jet stream, very high winds, etc., and so on. So it makes sense that you probably only need a, one good day as opposed to three, four, five good days. And speed is probably the term I most understood, misunderstood, uh, misunderstood, actually misunderstood when I, when I talk to people. When we just returned from Tibet, um, the movie of Gene, when, seen when we climbed the sixth highest peak with 8,201 meters in 12 and a half hours to the summit. We've been back down in 18 hours, as opposed to a couple of days. I've been to a big European media house for an interview, and uh, the journalist asked me in his first question, he said, so, Mr. Böhm, um, could you enjoy anything when you climb up there so fast? And I said, excuse my English, but I said, uh, nobody enjoys shit up there, you know, number one, and because you're in a death zone. And number two, it's probably the, right, the, wrong par the wrong parameter to measure my ability of perception. So he thought, only because we are fast, we couldn't enjoy anything, we couldn't enjoy the landscape, we were less concentrated, etc., and so on. And, and this may be something we should all ask ourselves. What would have be been the right question to measure my, my level of perception? What would have be been the right, the right source of data? I'm just talking about data. We also, as mountaineers, work a lot with data. What have been, would have been the right source of data to understand how my perception level is, my, my ability of perception? We all have it. Anyone has an idea? How do you measure speed? Like, could I perceive anything or not? Heart rate. The question would have been, what is your heart rate? And maybe you ask yourself the question, what is your heart rate as a student and so on? Because speed, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, is totally subjective. Um, what, could be f what might be fast for you is very slow for another one or whatsoever. Speed is most of all, I would say, as I said, these 80% of preparation. We were obsessed about doing that in a fast way that we got up every second day, we climbed uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the highest peak of Germany, Zugspitze, and we were back at the office at 9 o'clock in, in, in the morning. So that was this obsession. We woke, we woke up with that thought, we got to bed with that thought of climbing 8,000 meter peak. We prepared technically. We filed a lot of patents, by the way. We filed a lot of patents how we prepared our technology to get into this perfect state of flow. And that was our idea. So the heart rate would have been the right parameter. Why? Because it might be that we do it in a day, but our heart rate is much lower than maybe someone who's doing it in a couple of days, even with oxygen. The heart rate is the right measurement, and that's a little bit what we should do also as entrepreneurs. Because speed, ladies and gentlemen, um, in our world, is probably the only competitive advantage we have. The only competitive advantage we have. Because it will not be the labor cost, for sure not. It will not be the energy cost, for sure not. It will be how fast we are. 
how efficient we are. And being fast means most of all that we are innovative. Because in order to be fast, you have to do something a little bit more clever than the other guys. And obviously, there's a lot of pressure uh, on our, let's say, on our marketplace. And we have to think a little bit in the future, how do we want to differentiate? And speed will be the main differentiation with all what comes there. Because we produce a little bit faster, we produce more clever, et cetera, and so on. This is what we are doing in the end. So, of course, it was always a journey into uncertainty. And obviously, as human beings, we don't like uncertainty. And I brought that here on purpose because in a moment, um, yeah, we, heard a lot, we don't hear the best news about our marketplace, about our economy, about inflation, about uh, energy prices, all these things we have, crisis, recession, etc., and so on. But I would like to promote a little bit these times of uncertainty. Because why was I even looking for this, I would almost call them self-caused crisis? You know, why I was going to a company which was bankrupt and we tried to build it up? Why I was exposing myself, like next week again, somewhere in Nepal, um, in the middle of nowhere, where, where there's no rescue whatsoever on these mountains? Why was I doing that? There's two things. Um, first, times of uncertainty and times of crisis, as at least we feel it as entrepreneurs and, and as business leaders, um, we, are, we are absolutely asked, and if we don't do it, we do it wrong, we are asked to focus. What I had to decide before we did the speed ascents, and this was probably the, I would say, the key learning for me, not only as, as a business leader, but also as, as a family father of three kids, was to absolutely concentrate on the essential, on what we need in order to survive. Because one thing was clear, if you want to do something in 18 hours or whatever, up and down, as opposed to three, four, five days, we have to be light. We have to be light in order to be fast. And the key question was, and that was for me um, almost enlightening, we call it gun to head scenario, the key question was, what do we need? What do we need in order to survive? It was, much, it was much harder to say, what are we not taking up, as opposed to what are we taking up? Because all of us here, how many living hours do we have? All of us, usually, as a, middle, as a central European. We have 10 years more than the average. How many living hours? I think it was 27 years when the first person uh, somewhere in China on 7,400 meters died in my arms, and I thought it could have been me. You know, the most valuable thing we have is, is us. I mean, is our living time here on this wonderful planet. And so I calculated our living timing, living hours. How many living hours? Anyone has an idea? You should know that. <laughs> 700,000 700, living hours. Total, cross, okay? 700,000 living hours we have. Um, pff, might sound a lot. I think it doesn't sound as much, but this, that's total. We have to get into life. We have to get out of life. We have to sleep, etc. So net, you know, really time available. I don't know, you can answer the question for yourself. Is it 100, 200, 300,000 hours you have really available, you know, consciously, not as a baby somewhere in... in. Um, how many things do we have? I mean, we are the most... We are the most successful collectors in this world. I mean, there's, there's never our ancestors, you know, when 10,000 years ago, when they were walking here in their tribes, they would have been very proud of what we all have. But this is only a symbol of how many things we actually have. Think about your, your wardrobe, your basement, your garages, only physical things. I'm not talking about digital impressions we have, but physical things. How many, what do you think? What a Central Europe, a typical average Central, Central European has as physical, physical things. 10,000, any other ideas? But not too bad. I mean, it's getting, every year it's getting a little bit more. We are all in the growth trap, right? But this is, would be a different discussion, but for sure it's more than any other generation before us. It's 25, it's between 25 and 30,000 things we have, okay? Um, which we somehow govern, which we have to manage, even if we're just moving again houses and we have to throw them in the bin. So we are governing 20, between 25 and 30,000 things in our 700,000 living hours we have in total. Then we have probably more digital impressions to digest and to filter and to structure than our ancestors had impressions in their, probably their entire life. And then we had to decide, and this is what I meant by enlightening moment, and then we had to decide what do we need in order to survive and what is just important. And this is what we call the gun to head scenario. So what would we leave away or what would we take up if we had the gun 
to our head. This was the idea. And here I come again back to the obsession. We were cutting every lace, we were cutting every gram. We always asked ourselves, does it make us faster or not? Does it make us faster or not? If it didn't make us faster, the second question was, does it have an essential safety function or not? If it didn't have, we were cutting off. So we were cutting hair, we were cutting laces, we were cutting everything, everything, gram by gram, what we could cut, every single thing. We were cutting our material, we were cutting, tuning our material. What do you think was my total weight, the total weight setup I brought up now to, uh, to Chooyo? I mean, everything. If I was standing here naked and there was been my entire equipment, again, minus 30 degrees, winds, etc. Uh, you need some, obviously, some ice tools and all these kind of... The skis were, by the way, always an insurance for us that we get quickly out of the death zone if something, if something goes wrong. But what do you think was my total weight in kilograms, what we started with, made more or less from base camp. Anyone has an idea? Pardon? 15 kilo? That's already pretty light, yeah? Other ideas? It was now when we started in Tibet, you know, trying to do something which, I don't know, hasn't been, I think, even done before. Um, we started with a total weight setup, and that's including everything, drink, food, um, everything we had in our backpack, with 7.48 kilograms. 7 so below 7.5 kilograms. And that's, in the end, the summary and the obsession where we... I think there's never been anybody in this world, even not me, because it's an endless journey, even not me, anybody in this world who started with 7.5 kilograms to an 8,000-meter peak. That's nothing, absolutely nothing. And it's this art of omission, the art of leaving away, because it sounds simple, but actually, in order to really focus the gun to head scenario, you have to be very deep into detail. You have to understand how do you synchronize yourself, your human capital, the human capital of your partner, so the, let's say, the combined human capital, how do you synchronize that with the hostile environment, with an absolutely death zone? That was the key question. And that was, for me, somehow almost inspirational, because um, I came back to it and I took it into the company, 21 years ago, and the only thing we did 21 years ago was that we were cutting 60% of the product line. The only reason why I joined this company was the first boot binding system, by the way, invented from a Tyrolean, okay? The first boot binding system invented by Tyrolean, an incredible deductive product, which didn't work, by the way. This was my first marketing lesson. It's not enough to, to invent an incredible product. This product should have blown away the competition like that. I, do we have skiers here? Some skiers? Yes, I like it. Um, so then you might know the Dunafit low-tech system. And that system was so disruptive, so deductive, that, again, it should have blown away the competition, but it didn't. And why didn't it do? And this was, again, my first marketing lesson, and I come back to the art of reduction, because there's always the same principle, and I give you here a, marketing, a quick marketing lecture, and the same principle of a triology, which is the same in any culture around the world. What you see is what you know, what you know is what you trust, and what you trust is what you buy. Very simple. What you see is what you know, what you, what you know is what you trust, and what you trust is what you buy. That product didn't sell, and it was already invented in 1983, even though it was genius. It was almost like you invent a car, it only uses one-tenth of the, of the gas, it's one-tenth of um, the weight, and it's ten times more efficient than any car in the world. But it doesn't look like a car. And here come back to the human being. People buy from people because they trust them. People buy, people buy from brands because they trust them. And that binding didn't fulfill the trusted codes. A trusted code is, I don't know, a trusted code is this one, a bottle. is a trusted code because it looks like a bottle, or a glass, or a chair, or a car, has four wheels, etc. A ski binding, and we have some skiers here. A ski binding looks like a binding because it has a toe piece and a heel piece, right? and then you clamp the boot in between. But that binding was so disruptive, it didn't look like a ski binding, it looked like a mouse trap. It looked like a mouse trap. it had a little thing, so that was the difference. So the only thing we did is, and it didn't sell, because people said, I don't trust this mouse trap. I'm not going to ski in a mouse trap. Um, the only thing we did is, we cut 60% of the product line 21 years ago, we tripled the turnover from two to almost six million, only because we focused on the essential. It is much harder to say no than yes, but it was also the question here, what brings us up and what not? We were just cutting everything. And probably, unfortunately, the brand had to go bankrupt before, before these radical, uncompromising decisions could have been taken. 
What is the emotional effect? And I think we should be all aware of this. Um, maybe also when you go into your studies, and maybe for, for many of you it's new, maybe you are away from home, you are, you're coming here to Innsbruck, or, and so on and so forth. But what is the emotional effect of uncertainty? What is the emotional effect of uncertainty, usually, for human beings? Fear. And this is something we should be aware of. Um, I would recommend you, and I think it's a great, you know, it's a great moment for you guys to learn and to have the luxury to learn, to be in a state, I just come back from Pakistan, where it's not normal that you study um, at all, where this is missing actually in many, unfortunately, many provinces and so on I've seen. Um, I hope that you are bringing a little bit the curiosity, the curiosity over fear, but usually the emotional effect is fear, and we should be totally aware of it. It's, it's normal, it's natural. I was very scared of. But one thing I can promise you, and this is the reason I wanna, why I want to talk a little bit about fear, is, and I have to manage a lot, my fear and my courage. There is no courage without fear, so there is no courage without fear. Is, and this should give us courage, is that the fear of, the fear of, the angst for, the fear of is much, much greater than the fear in the situation. So the fear of the situation we have when we, listen, when we listen to our kids and to our, I don't know, to anyone, to ourselves even, we always talk about we are afraid of, we are scared of, um, we have angst for. But we hardly talk about being scared in. And I don't have any scientific proof for that, but I can promise you that it is like that. Because I've been in life-threatening situations. I remember at Manaslu, the eighth highest peak of the world, where 11 people died around me in an absolute avalanche disaster. Where I was not sure if I'm going to survive the day or not. Um, in the middle of the night, I don't want to go too deep, but... In many of these life threatening situations I've been to, I was never scared in. I was not scared in this situation because I had to survive, I had to do, I, I didn't have time to be scared. And this should give us courage because usually we are in the luxury in our world with full of infrastructure, etc., that we can prepare towards that fear. So if we are scared off, we can build that marriage castle, this courage muscle. We call it the courage muscle because the best answer to fear is courage. But how do you build up courage? And the best answer to, clear, to uncertainty, by the way, and that's only my answer, but I think it is the best answer, also is leaders, but you don't have to be a leader, a hierarchical leader, or you don't have to be a top manager or whatsoever for that, is clarity. Clarity is the best answer to uncertainty. And anyone, also any one of you, can look for clarity. You can ask your director, you can ask mates, you can do whatever. And the moment you, you are reflecting, in the moment you are you're focusing, you're thinking about, hey, where do I need clarity? And you're addressing, you're addressing this topic. Sometimes I have to address my topic to stakeholders, you know, in a very well-structured way. Um, you are looking for clarity. You are leading. You are leading. And you can do that with anyone and everyone, with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your whatever. You can always look for clarity. Or you can just, like we did as mountaineers in the beginning, because we didn't want to talk about our fears. This was nat not naturally given, what I'm telling here. This was a, a long, long journey over many years. We didn't want to talk about you know, fears and, and different perceptions and expectations and so on. We did it like real males are doing it, you know, about con potential conflicts, how are real men, how are me real men uh, managing c potential conflicts? Not talking about it, right? Not talking about it, that's all good. So what we did is, um, understanding after all these years of, of being, becoming a little bit, I would almost say courage, you know, courage experts, <laughs> um, we try to look for clarity. So what we see here is Gasherbram 2. Gasherbram 2 is um, one of these 8,000 meter peaks in, at the border between Pakistan, India, and China. And we wanted to not only climb up that peak in a very fast time, but also ski down. And what we did is we came up with um, a principle, a concept, a methodology that we try to translate and I can only recommend that for you. I mean, in any situation you are, we try to translate our fear into data. Again, this was not given. This came over many, many years um, of, of being together, of talking about the death zone before we entered together into the death zone where we made a lot of mistakes. And what we did basically, how we translate, um, yeah, how we turn fear into data, we said it's the fear cloud. Okay, everybody has ever heard about the cloud. There's, there's, the different clouds where you set your data. And we call it the fear cloud. Why is cloud a good name? Because clouds don't have clear lines and edges and so on. Clouds are invisible. You don't even know what you're scared of, right? You cannot grab your fear. So we, we, quantified, we quantified our personal fear cloud, because fear is as personal as speed, what you might be scared of, 
and your friend is maybe not scared at all because fear is totally different, is that we quantified that, that fear cloud with 100%, and down there is base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, etc. And so I took these 100% of my fear cloud and I was splitting it up onto the mountain, onto the route. So my fear factor, we call it fear factor, was down there, 3% and going up. This, by the way, you see this little dot here? This is a human being, just that you get a little bit of dimensions. This is a climber, mountaineer. You get the dimensions of, of this mountain. So it was 3%, 5%, slowly going to death zone, 7%, um, what do you have, 9%. 13% in the summit area, a lot of unknown unknowns. And then I found out for myself that my main fear factor is with 63% in the downhill. So what I found here is clarity. Um, suddenly I was aware, okay, my key fear factor with 63% is here in the, in the downhill. And I can only recommend you, if you visualize things, um, it's so beautiful because you actually get clarity. By the way, also in between the team, because one thing, if it is clear in your head, but it might be a totally different picture than your, your colleague or your friend or your professor as in, in his or her head. So if you visualize things, you, you, sort of, you build a common base. This is what we tried to do. Because there was a common base of the mountain, but we had totally different emotions about the mountain because our fear factor, our courage, um, our, our fear, our strength, weaknesses were very different. So I knew, and we call it again the courage muscle, I knew that I have to prepare, I have to invest most of my training time into the downhill. I have to perfect my state of flow in these very steep phases because we knew that nobody ever skied Gasherbram 2. We were the first ones to do it. We knew that one tried it and he died on the way down because we knew if you make a mistake, um, you're going to fall all the way. So I tried to replace my fear by awareness by investing 20,000 living hours. That's, by the way, a statistically proven number. If you invest 20,000 living hours of your life, you become an expert. This is usually the, the minimum investment. If you see Olympic champions, if you see any expert in his or her field, these people usually invested 20,000 living hours. If you see world champions, musicians, or whatever it is, anyone in his or her profession who is an absolute top expert, a worldwide champion, these people usually invested 20,000 living hours. And here we come back to your obsession. Why should you invest 20,000 living hours if you're not obsessed by what you're doing? But the beautiful, the most beautiful thing is, and I mean, you're all here together. Um, you are here together, students. You are supported by teams, by uh, lecturers, by teachers, by professors, by, you know, a lot of people, by your families, is that we, as human beings, grew up through cooperation. And probably one big part of that cooperation was that we are individuals, because my partner, and this only happened when we suddenly were talking about how we are managing the death zone together, because before we were not really synchronized, my partner had a totally different, opposite fear factor. His fear factor was with 65% in the uphill, he was coming from a different background, he was an extreme skier, and with 65% in the uphill, totally opposite to my fear factor, and only 35% in the downhill. So what we did now, by having this brutal transparency, this clarity in between us and for ourselves, we synchronized. We've built a unit. We build a unit. And I can only ask you, look for these partners. Look for these partners, whatever you do, where you feel there's different strengths and weaknesses, and make it, make it uh, yeah, build a unit. You know, we were filling the gaps. We were closing the gaps by, by sort of um, filling the fear of one with the courage of another one, strength, weaknesses. We call it situational leadership. Situational leadership was that we understood that there's not one ultimate leader who always has the answer, but we permanently changed leadership um, depending on what we had to challenge in front of us. So by building this unit and by having the symb symbiosis, we suddenly did things together, one each other, or one of, one of us alone would have never made. I would have never skied Gashabram 2, even if I was able to, but I just didn't have the courage without him. So I was more or less leading on the way up, and he was leading on the way down, and suddenly we did things together we couldn't do together. And this was, for me, one of the most yeah, conscious, when, I, when we suddenly understood that we consciously working on this concept, on this methodology, on this strategy, um, one of the most enlightening moments, because this is how I'm leading also today. All my people are much, much better than me. They're the top experts in their field, but we're just trying to permanently change leadership. 
So let's have a look at the original footage when we climbed into, when we climbed Gashabram 2 in 12 and a half hours. For me, it was the starting point. Most people, by the way, um, the die statistically on these high mountains on the way down um, because they used up all their power to reach the summit and they don't yeah, uh, have enough power left to make it back to base camp, but you're actually in the highest point of the death zone. So let's have a, have a look at the original footage when we started here on the top of Gashabram 2. And here you see why I was maybe scared. We knew it's between 50 and 55 degrees. If you have the mountain right next to it, then you, uh, yeah, you see it looks a little bit different than Nordkette or something here in Innsbruck. And this is what it looked like when we started at the top of um, Gashabram 2. When someone da stürzt, then he has no Zahnschmerzen mehr. Then it's not a Beinbruch, then it's an Absturz. Right, positive, bitte. Und dann geht es von so einem ganz schmalen Grad, links 1000 Meter nach China runter, rechts 1000 Meter nach Pakistan. Und dann haben wir beim Aufgehen, beim Aufsteigen schon gemerkt, dass es eine ziemlich heikle, heikle Situation noch im Abfahren geben wird. Wow, hey. Wie ist denn der Schnee? You fight for us, you fight me in China. Was ich? Ja? Hat sich halt hier am Seil. First of all, I'm happy that it's over. Very excited. Yeah, I was really uh, very tired. This was the original footage when we arrived back to base camp after 17 hours. I lost six kilograms of my uh, body weight at the time, and, but we've been already in Pakistan for a couple of weeks, so I was on, on a minimum weight anyway. But if I think about why I was already planning soon after my next expedition, it was probably, and why am I doing this? Because many of you probably ask yourself, why, why do you do this and, and what, what is this is all about? But I think the main reason why I'm doing this is probably because I know that life is short and that we are not outgrowing ourselves. I think this was always my motivation to outgrow myself and maybe together with great people that I'm not willing to outgrow myself because I reached an 8,000 meter peak yesterday. It's probably the next 8,000 meter peak which is in front of us which makes you yeah, take full advantage of the day, which makes you get up early and to do something and getting into the day and building up this momentum. You know, this is, this is the most intense feeling, building up this momentum and outgrowing yourself. This was at least my motivation. I wish you guys um, all the best for, for your studies. And before we come to an end, I only wanted to, Andy was already referring to it at the beginning, I only wanted to uh, um, yeah, share with you my, my personal um, let's say, my personal initiative, which is called Helping Band. It's nothing else than a little bracelet. And I've seen, let's say, the incredible changes within the mountain environment over the past decades, not only here in the Alps, but also in the Himalayas, in Pakistan, in Tibet, in, in China, etc., and so on, um, where, we have, where we just see the, the climate change. I just come back, back from Pakistan with 40 degrees on, on, on five, 6,000 meters, which we never had before. And I said, hey, we, we, all have, we all can make an impact, even if it's just our little ecosystem. And that's the reason why I founded Helping Band. And uh, basically, it's nothing else than a bracelet. And my idea was a lot of small contributions also make a big contribution. And as a WF ambassador, um, the idea is that I look personally at this nature marine resort because probably nature marine resorts are the most efficient yeah, a way, way to protect ourselves a little bit from ourselves because today we are 8 billion people, tomorrow we will be 10 billion people and there's a lot of pressure on this one world we have. And the idea was, um, yeah, let's try to make efficient nature marine resorts because it's also better, better for us because if we grow, for example, the fish population a little bit more efficiently in, in marine resorts, it's also better for us in the end of, by the end of the day. So this is what I'm doing and I'm very happy that you will all get one. 
There's two different sizes, just to check it out. There's going to be the size LXL, which is what I wear here. It's 202 millimeters, and then there's another size, LSM, and that's 180 millimeters, so probably more for, for the ladies in the room. And um, yeah, I'm happy if you, if you bring the idea further, and I wish you guys, again, all, all the best for your expeditions and what you're doing now with your studies, what you focus on. And whenever you are on the way, maybe from Innsbruck to Kufstein and, and to Germany to Bavaria, you're more than welcome to visit our new headquarter. There's no excuse because it's right by the highway. Um, it's basically really right by the highway, just before Kufstein from the Bavarian side. And um, actually in three seconds, you're gonna be there. There's a big public space with a big restaurant. You can build your own skis, you, your own individual ski. It's called the Ski Factory. And um, there's a big brand world. I think for anyone who's in marketing and so on, it's also an interesting, interesting one. Happy to have a coffee with you. I wish you all the best. Thank you for listening. And all the best for your studies. Thank you. Many, many thanks, dear Benny. I've marked down a number of questions, but uh, as we have limited time, I would uh, directly look into the audience and is there uh, questions? I would perhaps uh, allow three to four questions uh, to not uh, to make use of the time. And perhaps we may collect at least two of them and then uh, uh, forward them on to you. Please say who you are briefly and then uh, go on. Okay, so my name is Kevin Sprenger. Um, and my question for you is, many people have a passion or even an obsession for a hobby, but very few choose to be uh, entrepreneurs. How were you able to transform your obsession with ski touring to an obsession that also extends to all of the aspects about the uh, entrepreneurship around it? Um, it's a good question. I mean, it was not given at all, so I was really struggling after my studies. It was not that I that I had it already on my mind because I had no idea how to build a career out of ski touring. I didn't want to become a mountain guide. That was not my, you know, not my, my passion. I, I wanted to be, I wanted to work with real products and, 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 yeah, and all these things, but I had no idea because this industry, as I said, 30 million euros small, it hardly existed. And, um, but still, I was in the national team. I saw the ski binding. I had the same experience. I told you about the, what you see is what you know, etc. I saw the ski binding. I didn't trust it because it was looking like a mousetrap. And my, my national team colleagues said, hey, you have, to, you have to ski that binding if you want to win races. And then I, I skied it. And then I, I applied for this company. You know, I applied for this company. The salary was, was, was much worse than anything, uh, than any other offer. But I just felt um, it is right. And then... I never thought it's going to come out like that, but then it just, you just build step by step. As I said, you know, you underestimate what we can, what we can achieve in the long term, but um, it was trying also a lot of things. I think this is maybe something what, I, what, I, what is different maybe from generations I see today who apply for a job at Dunafit is sometimes I miss a little bit the, the if you even don't know what you're doing, but I was trying a lot of things. I did a trainee program here, and I also finished it, even though I felt it was not. Because also by knowing what you don't want to do, um, you also find out a little bit more what you want to do. You know, so um, this is maybe also something. I was sometimes super frustrated because I didn't know. I did. I just didn't. It didn't feel right, and I tried out a lot of things. So it didn't happen from today till tomorrow that I started at Dunafit. Um, but I was trying a lot of things, and I knew that's 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 not it. And then finally, uh, it, it works. I mean. It will be like love, you know, if you, if you fall, in, fall in love, you suddenly you feel that's it, but maybe you had a couple of boyfriends and girlfriends before. <laughs> All right, second question, please. I'm Samuel, uh, just started digital business and software engineering this year, and I'm going to ask a little bit of a cheeky question, um, something the MCI might not be able to help me with. You're a successful business manager, you're a successful mountaineer, but you also mentioned you have three children, and I'm planning to have a family. So, yeah, I'm curious to your thoughts of combining having a family and uh, having such a workload and being, having such a great obsession. No, thank you also for this. Um, let's say I understood this question as two, so how to cope the risk a little bit, but also how to manage these three, um, yeah, three big poles in my life. So the first one is, um, 
and I think this was, was, a, was a learning where I also had to outgrow myself, but also together with my wife, where we are, were outgrowing ourselves. And before we, we started a family, I had to find clarity for myself that I cannot just, set, let's say, I cannot just delete my passion. I cannot just say I'm not a mountaineer anymore and I'm only, um, you know, I'm only playing around in the, in the Alps, etc. and so on. And I said, if I do that, I will be an unhappy person. And I think what happened in this conversation when I found clarity for myself and then tried to find clarity with my wife before we started the family is that we at least for us said, hey, our responsibility is first of all to be happy for, for ourselves each. And, um, and I said, I, I probably I will always be like that. Even if I'm not a mountaineer, I'm out there. I, I wanna, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's inside of me. I cannot just stop it. And, and I think this was a very, let's say, important conversation because, um, yeah, because this was leading to insurances, to all the things I didn't think before. We said, okay, if you continue this life, then what I insure is what happens if you die because it's an option and so on. I had to be very conscious about that. And the second one, um, yeah, how do I manage that? So I don't have the, the golden formula, unfortunately. There's not a, you know, um, it's also not, hap no, it's not happening successfully. But I think all in all, it is because I love what I'm doing. You know, for me, work is, is hardly work because I'm, I'm obsessed also about pushing this, this, this company forward with a great team. And, and also here, I'm very concentrated and very focused. I think very consciously about the 24 hours I have, we all have every day, and um, I'm thinking about which email I read, which meeting I attend, um, if I go to this wedding or not, and, and so on. It's, my, it's our living time. It's the most important thing. So um, I'm very conscious about what I do and what I don't do. And I get up early. I don't watch Netflix in the evening. Um, I'd rather get up an, an hour early. It's, you know, life is a decision. And it's a decision for all of us and all of you every day. We have to decide what we want to do. And then maybe we, we shouldn't be frustrated if we are losing an hour of, of learning because we had a long night out. And that's okay to do. It. So I'm not saying here it's right or wrong, but it's a decision we have to take um, every day because you only have 24 hours and 700,000 living hours. And by the end of the day, it's also a team, um, and this is probably the biggest gift. And um, today, when I go to expedition um, to Nepal or, or whatever, I have a great team at home with my wife, and I have a great team in, in the company where I'm, where I'm totally released. And sometimes I even have to call and say, "Is everything all right?" So um, this is maybe the second one. You have to build up these bases where um, things roll. I try to explain it to my wife in the following way. <laughs> now, do you want to have a passionate and uh, energetic husband who is full of dreams or a complacent couch potato, uh, which I also once in a while. Anyway, next question. Hello, my name is Martin. First and foremost, thank you very much for this very, very Starting interesting. Starting what? Industrial engineering, which is my point, what I'm getting to. Um, as industrial engineers, we know, or we're getting taught a lot about sustainability. And I also want to say thank you for building Helping Band. Why did you choose um, this specific material? Why um, plastic? I'm very sure, I'm very, very sure you have gotten this critic a lot before. And I kind of also want to know how you've answered these questions or criticisms yeah. in the past. No, thank you for, for this critical question. Um, there's a couple of things that I don't want to go too deep, but um, first of all, welcome to check out the website. There's a big, there's a big topic about that in helpingband.com, but that's maybe one of the big misunderstandings. It's silicon, not plastic. Um, silicon has nothing to do with plastic. Actually, that's, this is coming from quartz. Um, still, you know, there's a full recycling process, et cetera, and so on, but my main driver for using silicon is that it's, first of all, a great material, even though it's very often misunderstood with plastic. And second, I wanted to stay um, on five euro. For me, it was really important that the retail price of Helping Band is not more than five euros because I, I wanted to make this, a, um, let's say, a common movement. And, and this was, from my studies, very clear that if you are beyond five euros retail price, the people are not buying into that. Knowing that even if silicon, you know, I have a full recycled process, really a cradle to cradle process behind that and so on, um, knowing that I still have a footprint with anything. I also have a footprint as with Dinafit, et cetera. But, um, but that was for me a key, a key driver. But it's a starting point. You know, I'm starting small also here in very small footsteps. And hopefully, um, Helping Band is getting a big idea. And then we can go to a different material, which also doesn't, doesn't have this hello effect of, of plastic. But again, thank you for this question. And really check out the, the website where you have a full 
um, full explanation about what silicon is and how it's produced and how we actually also recycle it um, and bring it 100% back into the recycling process when you send all back the old bands. So uh, I, as we have to come to an end, there's two more questions. Perhaps we can collect them and uh, then, uh, and then uh, answer them jointly. All right. Where is the microphone? Oh, OK, here, in the first row. Um, hi, my name is Lily. I'm in my fifth semester of entrepreneurship hi. for sport and tourism management. And I have or had an obsession for sport event management, but through my studies, I've gained way more obsessions and passions. And now I'm kindly at the point where I don't really know what to do and which obsession or passion I should follow. So maybe you have an advice here for us students to really find the obsession and passion you need. Well, I think this, this question, I mean, in the end, you can only answer for yourself, you know, and I know it's a tough one to answer, um, but to listen deep inside you, and, and again, I also said, as I said before, maybe to try out a couple of things, because even if you don't know, I wouldn't hesitate too much um, by wasting time not to do anything, you know, even to start a job where, in the beginning, where you're not 100% sure about, but you start it, and you get to know people, and you're inside, you know, you're inside um, at least this environment, and you somehow, you meet another person, and, and again, it's already one step towards something, because you, even if you know this is not the right thing to do, but um, the only recommendation I can give you is, um, because in the end, you know, the answer is somewhere inside of you, but you still haven't found it, um, is just, just try, you know, try step by step, and give yourself also a little bit of time where you say, I always said to myself, if I do something, if I started a company or something, I'd do it at least for one year. You know, this was also, this was always my, my thing, except it is a total disaster, you know, and it's a waste of time. But this is a little bit, um, this was my answer to it, but your answer might be different and, and might, might be even better. So I cannot 100% uh, say, but we are happy to talk at a beer later on. <laughs> so please, last question. And uh, after the, the answer, please stay in the room for, for a brief announcement, okay? Where is the microphone? Ganz, ganz hinten, Andreas. All right, in the very back. Hi, um, I'm studying business management and I really don't want to offend you with that question, but um, you said the environment is really important to you. But to get to the destination where you can do mountain engineering, you'll probably fly by train a lot. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? Or how can you justify it, that traveling, but at the same time? Like well, you know, I think this is really important for all of us. And I think we should, um, you know, we all live in this and big world, you know, there is no, there is no black and white, you know, you are, I'm, I'm never, you know, this was also really important for me with helping band and also being again a business leader where we have a footprint and so on. Um, we come to this world and we have a footprint, you know, otherwise, so what is really important, we live in this and big world, but this doesn't mean that we cannot start to make small steps here, you know, so I'm very aware that not only as a private person, um, if it's my expeditions, but also um, being a businessman, that I have a, maybe a, a bigger footprint than, than the average, for sure. Um, I absolutely have. Um, but on the other hand, this, doesn't, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be a, a border that I say, I don't do anything and I'm just bad. You know, I still can do something. And we live in this ambiguous world, and I somehow live in this conflict with the ambiguous world. For me personally, yes, a lot, because we, we sell products to the environment, but, but also here, you know. Um, with Unifit, I think in the biggest transition we are, and it's actually for me the, the toughest one, but also the most, um, not only the most challenging one, but also the most beautiful one is what I call the sustainability transition. Um, today we give a lifetime guarantee on all our products, on all our products, which, is, which wouldn't have ever happened 10 years ago because people would have said, why do you do that? And we want to sell and maximize our profit. But today maybe it's less, but better, you know? Why do we give a lifetime guarantee? Because we say that the most sustainable product is the one you have. You know, I know that we have 20 to 30,000 products, and that's something I, I really cope with, and, and where, where I see we don't have an added value anymore if we sell the 35,000 product or whatsoever. So it is rather the idea to build brands for the future who, um, 
who have that, who are following the custom, I would say, until the lifetime, um, until the, the end of the life cycle of the product. But to your question, yes, absolutely. Um, I have, I'm living in this ambiguous world, um, and I cannot, I'm not here to say, hey, I'm an angel or whatsoever, totally not. I'm living in this ambiguous world, but on the other hand, I know that this is something I, I say, I say it in German because maybe we'll understand. For me, there's one saying, man wirkt immer und man kann immer etwas bewirken, um, auch wenn es nur in seinem Unfall ist. You always make an effect, even if it's only in your ecosystem. So many, many thanks to you, Benedict Bim, for sharing your thoughts, for letting us uh, enjoy your dreams, your fascinations, your passion, and uh, also your experiences. Thank I think you. that deserves an applause. Ben. Also, bist du schon? Oh, as, as I'm not sure whether they have something to put on at dinner fit, uh, we prepared the MCI, the legendary oh, wow. MCI hoodie. So Thank I you. hope it fits you well. And whenever you drop by at, at Kufstein or Kiefersfeld, make sure that he's wearing this hoodie. I will. Okay. Thank you Thank very, you very Thank much. You.